When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who, when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith, declared, I could not be shaken. Hello, my friends, and welcome back to Unshaken. I'm Jared Halverson, and today we are covering all the rest of 1 Samuel. Last week, we covered Ruth and the first seven chapters of 1 Samuel, where we met Hannah and the boy Samuel and Eli and his wicked sons. We had the strange chapters about uh, golden emeralds and raiders of the lost ark. If you didn't finish last week's material, it gets pretty wild by the end. Uh, but today, we'll, we'll pick up where we left off in 1 Samuel chapter 8 which is an all-important chapter, especially for any parent or grandparent out there that has had to worry about children or loved ones making decisions they don't agree with. And that probably applies to all of us. Now, that's 1 Samuel chapter 8. So we'll start uh, right off the bat with something really, really important. And from there, we will spend time with Samuel and with Saul. We will, about at the halfway point today, we'll meet David and Goliath, uh, one of everybody's favorite stories. Uh, we'll go far beyond the veggie tale, however, and stick to the text and see some detail that perhaps we've always missed in the past. And then the second half of today's material will cover some incredible stories about the, the downfall of Saul and the rise of David. We get to meet Abigail in the second half, and she is so worth getting to know. I mean, if you stick with just the chapters that are assigned us in this week's Come Follow Me, we will cover eight chapters. But there's 24 that deserve our, our discussion. And so I'm going to try to be as concise as possible, which I know is, and it sounds impossible for me. Uh, but roll up your sleeves and get comfortable. We may be here for a while, but we have some amazing things to talk about. Uh, and like I said, it all starts with this amazing chapter about the, the Samuel principle, as I like to call it. Now, I want to set the stage for 1 Samuel chapter 8 with this quick story. This was years ago. A couple had come to me seeking some counsel, some advice. And the specific situation, I won't get into the details, but they had an adult child that was, about, that was contemplating a major life change that would affect everyone that he was connected to. And it was going to destroy his immediate family. It would cause a divorce and... Uh, the loss of his children. He was preparing to walk away from all of that and make some dramatic changes in his own self-perception and self-identity uh, and walk away from everything that he had held dear in life up to that point. And his parents were devastated about the prospects of this decision. And like I said, if any of you parents or grandparents out there have had loved ones that are making decisions or have made decisions that break your heart, and you're just wondering, what do I do? Uh, I love my child. I want to support them, but I cannot support them in, in a lifestyle or in a choice that goes against everything I know to be true. And so how do I... I mean, this, this is one of the deepest and most gut-wrenching contraries we'll ever have to prove because it's so personal. It's when we are standing at the, at the crux of the cross between the, the vertical beam that connects us to God and the horizontal cross beam that connects us to other people. This is one of those gut-wrenching moments when the first great commandment and the second great commandment seem incompatible under the circumstances. That for me to love my neighbor, or in this case my child, or my sibling, or my prodigal parent, whatever it might be, I will be doing damage to my love of God, or vice versa. Those are the worst times when, when I can't do both simultaneously. And so which side do I err on and how do I strike the proper balance? And, and if you figure that out perfectly, well, you're above my pay grade. But I just remember sitting across the table from this couple and, and wondering, what do, I, what do I say? What kind of advice do I give them? This has to do with situations that never get brought up in the topical guide. And the scriptures, as you've probably guessed, are my go-to source for guidance and counsel. And so there I was sitting there thinking, what do I say? I've never been in this situation, and uh, there's no topical guide entry on this situation either. And so I did what I typically do. 
metaphorically, I gathered my cloud of witnesses. That's what I call it when I spread the scriptural, uh, the, the array of characters in front of me. And it, in my mind, it's like a, a chapel that has a Book of Mormon section that's really well, fam I'm really familiar with that one. Uh, an Old Testament familiar where people don't look like quite so recognizable. A New Testament section, it's smaller, but it's got some great stuff. Jesus is there. That's the best of all. Uh, Doctrine and Covenant section, some pearly great, pearly great price people that are in the foyer, maybe outside, but listening in. Anyway, I gather my cloud of witnesses and I, I pose my question to them. Or in this case, this couple's question. Uh, cloud of witnesses, scriptural figures, what advice would you give them under their set of circumstances? And sometimes you have to wait a while uh, when there's no uh, verse of scripture that pops immediately to mind. But as I pondered with confidence in what Nephi said, that if you'll feast upon the words of Christ, they, the words of Christ will tell you all things what you should do. I was banking on that. Okay, words of Christ. Okay, cloud of witnesses. Tell me what this couple should do. And as I pondered, I just, a little hand started going up in the, near the back of the Old Testament section. And as I looked, I realized, oh, that's, that looks like Samuel. What, what do you have to offer? And he said, I have 1 Samuel chapter 8. Take them there. And as I was thinking, and, and as that, this story popped into my head, it's verse... Nine is where the Samuel principle really is emphasized. And it's in its simplest form, it's in 1 Samuel 8, verse 9. And I was going to take them right there, but it felt like Samuel was like, no, 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 start earlier. Tell them the whole story. There is more to my account that will be relevant to them than what you can possibly imagine. And so I took them to the beginning of the chapter and I was blown away. I think we all were at just how relevant this story was to their 21st century dilemma. And so let's do this together. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 1. It came to pass when Samuel was old, man, he grew up fast from where we met him last week, that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of the firstborn was Joel, and the name of the second, Abiah. These were judges in Beersheba. Now Joel means Jehovah is God, and Abiah means my father is Jehovah. These are good names. I've said this before, in the Old Testament, if you ever see a name that has an E-L in it, L, that's short for Elohim. And if you see a Yah, or an, a J-A-H, or an I-A-H, that's typically short for Jehovah. And so, Joel, Jehovah is God. That combines the two. And Abiah, my father, is Jehovah. It doesn't get much better than that. These are good reminders for these boys. You can kind of get a sense, perhaps, that Samuel, having been raised under the direction of Eli there in the tabernacle, but seeing these, the, the sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, that we were horrified by last week, I do not want my sons to turn out like that. And so may I give them names that will keep them in constant remembrance of the Lord their God. The Lord their father, if, he'll t if they'll take him as that. Well, would they live up to their names? Sadly, they didn't. Verse 3 says that his sons walked not in his ways. The fruit did fall far from the tree in their case. They turned aside after lucre and took bribes and perverted judgment. Sounds tragically like the sons of Eli, who were taking the, the best parts of the sacrificial offerings for themselves and threatening the offerers if they didn't go along with it. Uh, that, you sense that in the lucre, in the bribes, in perverting judgment, doing exactly... Well, ruining the exact thing they were supposed to be doing as judges in Israel. They couldn't be trusted with righteous judgment. Now, thankfully, there's no evidence here that they went as far as Hophni and Phinehas did in terms of, of ritual immorality at the, just outside the tabernacle. I mean, that's horrifying that we saw last week. We don't see any of that here. But still, it was enough to disqualify Joel and Abiah from really living up to their names. And that must have been an incredible grief to Samuel. And so now are you sensing some application, some relevance? This couple feeling, what, why, are my, why is my son thinking of this? Why is he wanting to go down this path? It's going to ruin his family. It's going to change his life dramatically. And it's breaking our heart and breaking the heart of his, his wife and children. So what do we do? Now, first of all, and we'll see the Lord help Samuel along this way in just a moment, 
you have to realize I'll put it this way. I hope I didn't come across too strong last week and th like, like I was trying to throw Eli under the bus. There were times that Eli did wrong and the Lord called him out on that. Eli, you knew your sons were doing this and you didn't call them out. You didn't stop them. You were afraid of what they would think. But I would imagine that when his boys were young, Eli had all the hope in the world for them and tried his very best to raise them well. Something happened later where he felt he couldn't stand up to them and couldn't, and, and again, that often seems to be the case, especially when our children become adults and leave the nest. Maybe that's part of the problem. But I don't, if there's one thing I know about Samuel, he's willing to stand up and speak truth to power. He's willing to, to do what's right, no matter what the consequences might be. So I don't see the same weakness in Samuel that I sensed in Eli last week. And yet his sons turned out just like the sons of Eli, pretty much. And that needs to, well, that should let us know that it's not all under the control of parents. Uh, I think we're sometimes under the delusion that our kids are going to turn out exactly how we in, intend for them to be when our children are young and, and will actually listen to us. But agency is a real thing. I don't know if we ever question the Lord's plan and start having second thoughts about the wisdom of Satan's plan, quite like parenting. Like, yeah, agency seems a little overrated. It was so nice in theory, but now that someone I love is using it in a, in a way I don't agree with, uh, can, can, we, can we do a recount in the war in heaven? Well, no. Agency is all important, and we'll see that in this chapter as well. But we do need to realize that sometimes children follow the Lord because their parents taught them to. Uh, set that example and the child followed it. You get Nephi and so many other righteous children of goodly parents. But that doesn't describe all of Lehi and Sarai's children. You see a layman who went astray despite the goodness of, of his parents. And then the flip side's true. Sometimes you get good kids despite their parents. That's the way Abraham, Abraham turned out amazing, but his dad tried to sacrifice him to pagan idols. I mean, not much of an upbringing, right? And then the other side, sometimes children reject God in the same way their parents did. In the New Testament, when you meet Salome, the daughter of Herodias, oh, there's a disgusting like mother-like daughter, both of whom are, are turning against God every chance that they can. And so if you kind of picture the quadrants there, good because of parents or good despite parents? Not so good because of parents. Not so good despite parents. It's, it's a mix. And it's a, a wrestle between nature and nurture. And we'll see more of that in a moment as well. In verse 4, Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together, and came to Samuel and to Ramah, and said unto him, Behold, thou art old. Sorry to break that to you. And thy sons walk not in thy ways. That's what we're even more sore, sorry about. So what's their solution? Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Now this is their specific decision. It was far different from the decision of this couple that I was counseling. But for Samuel, it was no less devastating. It, the thought of, no, 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 this is the wrong, the wrong thing to do. I've seen you guys go through the, or read stories of guys going, you guys going through the pride cycle so many times. Uh, and you need to turn to God and hold to him. He is the king of kings. And the only one that you should place your trust in, if you just hold to him, he will deliver you from every, every possible enemy. Samuel knows their decision is a bad one. But the way they ask the question also gives us some insight into where they're coming from. On the one hand, they say, we want a king to judge us like all the nations. Now think about that. We want to fit in. I'm tired of being a peculiar people. I just want to fit like every other nation around us. They have kings. Why can't we? Well, you do. It's the king of kings. Lord of lords. Nah, that's not what I meant. I want someone with a lot of flesh on their arm so I can put my trust in the arm of flesh. Now you see why Samuel's against this. But it's not just that we're raising children in a vacuum. Sometimes I wish we could. We're raising them amidst a culture that is often hostile to the best within us and hostile to the teachings of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yet our children particularly grow up in a world that they want to fit in with. And can we just be a little more like all the nations? 
So there's that pull. There's also this push away from the past because things, it's not going to work that way anymore. We live in a different time period and it's a different age and generation gaps and whatever. But especially in this case, we love you, Samuel. You did an amazing job guiding and leading and judging us. But you're old and, and we don't trust your sons. No offense. I'm sure you did the very best you could, but your sons don't walk in your ways. And so they are not worthy of the mantle being passed down. So we're going to have to change gears anyway. And here's something that struck me as I sat with this couple. Because in that moment, I could almost feel from Samuel this gut punch, like, this is my fault. Israel's going to turn against God because my own sons turned against God and turned against my teachings about God. If only I had done a better job of raising them, then they could have been worthy of the mantle being passed and, and Israel wouldn't be in this mess of a situation. And there was a part of me as I talked with these friends thinking, I wonder if they blame themselves and think, why, how did this turn out this way? It's our fault. We didn't do enough of this or we didn't do that. And, and I think the challenge here is it ends up putting us into a position of weakness when what our loved ones need from us is a position of strength, great spiritual strength, our confidence before God so that we can call down the powers of heaven and bless our children or our loved ones with it. We cannot, I mean, are we to blame? In part, of course. Lord, is it I? The answer will always be yes. But Lord, is it all I? The answer is never yes when you phrase it that way. It's not 100% nurture. Nor is it 100% nature. But we need to strike a better balance there. And do not blame yourselves in the moment because then you are abdicating any kind of offering of help. Instead, no, I'm the one to blame. And you, of course, I'm going to honor your decision. Of course, I'm going to let you do what you're going to do because I'm the one that's guilty and I'm not going to blame you for it. We, we have to be very careful with that. Next, in verse 6, But the thing displeased Samuel. There's no denying that. When they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. It hit me in that verse that we need to recognize our emotions and what it is that's moving us. In this case, it was displeasure on, on the part of Samuel. There may have been a little guilt from the previous verse. Now there's some displeasure. I'm frustrated with, this, with the people of Israel because they're doing something that I know is wrong. Now, here's the thing about emotion. It sure comes naturally, especially to the natural man. And that we need to be aware of. What is moving us? What emotion is pushing and making me? I think if we can be mindful and, and hold out our emotion and keep it at, at enough of a safe distance that we can actually analyze it and figure out what it is that we're feeling, am I feeling angry here? Uh, and is it just anger or is it righteous indignation or just I wish it were? Uh, remember DNC 121, reprove be times with sharpness when moved upon by the Holy Ghost. Well, is it really the Holy Ghost that's moving me or is it my own displeasure or my frustration or my impatience or, or my guilt or my self-consciousness or what will people think of me as a parent? Whatever it might be, we really need to be honest and, and self-aware and realize what emotion is is moving us. And then as we recognize it, what does Samuel do? He prays to God. He turns to him. I need a, a safer source of strength and direction here. So God, what would you have me do? Now the response probably shocked Samuel at first. Verse 7, the Lord says to him, hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee. Wait, wait, what? Do, give in over my dead body? There's, this is wrong, and I know it, and there's no way I'm going to let them do this. No, God says, honor their agency. The whole war in heaven thing, that was serious. And, and especially when it's the house of Israel, they outnumber you, Samuel. Or especially when they're an adult child, they're independent, even if you wish they weren't. They are making up their mind and... At the end of the day, they're going to do what they're going to do. In some ways, honoring their agency is what you're going to do by default. 
you can't avoid it, so you might as well choose to do so, because that will change your attitude and soften your emotions as well. Notice what he adds, though. He says, For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. This goes back to what I said earlier about you can't take the blame for this entirely, Samuel. In fact, primarily, this isn't between you and them. It's between them and me. And I think, again, from a position of strength, to be able to step aside, remove the personal emotion that, that makes this so difficult or triggering, and realize there are experiences that this person has had independent of me, and the choices that they're making reflect their relationship with God far more than they reflect their relationship with me. And to understand that, that helps, again, put things in better perspective. Verse 8, the Lord goes on, According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even until this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. Which is a way of saying, Samuel, they've always been this way. Don't blame yourself when this seems to be the story of the house of Israel. Uh, they were this way to Moses. Um, he was a pretty good leader. They were this way to Joshua, and he was pretty awesome. And if you remember every round of the pride cycle, even if they did well for a while, it just didn't seem to last. So be aware that, well, it goes back to the nature versus nurture. If we blame ourselves, it's because we are overestimating nurture and underestimating nature. Don't do that when your kids are doing great. Don't take all the credit for it, because then you'll have to take all the blame if they don't do so great. Okay? And yes, don't underestimate nurture. I'm not saying that either. I'll admit, in my very worst moments, I've said to my wife, nurture's a crock. They just come, come this way and that's it. But again, those are only in my worst moments. In my better moments, I realize the power of teaching, which is why I teach all the time. Uh, I know that it has an effect, or it can, as people allow it to, to soften hearts or change perspectives. I do have a testimony of nurture, but I also have a deep uh, testimony of nature. And in this case, it's as if the Lord is saying, Israel seems to be wired this way. And so do the very best you can to nurture them within their nature, but also understand it's not all up to you. Years ago, I was at a convention of seminary and institute directors from the South. And we were all together being trained and having all-day meetings and trying to figure out how to be better teachers and administrators and so on. And, and the meetings were over for the day. And we all got back together and we're just talking, just chatting as friends. And the conversation turned to parenthood. And I was amazed. I was one of the younger among them. And my kids were still young and in the ignorance is bliss phase and parenting's easy and I must be doing this really well because it's all nurture, right? I don't know. I've, I've learned different since. But a lot of my older colleagues, I was amazed at how many of them had shared pain over wayward children. And I know from my communication with many of you that so many of you are, are, are nursing similar wounds. And and have similarly broken hearts over the choices of your children that have left the church or abandoned the way, the things that you taught them, at least for a time. Hold out hope. Anyway, as I was overhearing, the, or as I was listening in and participating in the conversation, it, there, I sensed from my colleagues an overemphasis on nurture to the point of blaming themselves. And that's natural for teachers, <laughs> because the thought was, if I who teach the gospel for a living couldn't teach my children well enough to hold on to truth. It was almost this identity crisis or this professional crisis of, am I even qualified to teach other people's children if I evidently couldn't teach my own? And I knew the goodness of these colleagues and the, the depth of their discipleship and the strength of their t testimony and the love in their heart towards these children who have strayed. And I remember speaking up and saying, I think we're overestimating nurture and underestimating nature. And just like the Lord is saying here, they kind of came wired this way. And as I pondered and we discussed things, I just thought if I was Heavenly Father, knowing 
exactly who my spirit children are. If I had a child that by nature was, well, you could put it this way, one of the leaders in the war in heaven because they were so strong on agency and you, over my dead body is Satan going to take anything from me? Well, that's... <laughs> Do you have any teenagers like that? Uh, that are still bristling over any kind of, oh, somebody trying to impinge upon their agency? Well, picture God saying, if I was going to send a child I knew would struggle anywhere, where better to send them than to parents who will teach them diligently? that will raise them under the nurture and admonition of the Lord and will love them despite of any poor decisions that they make. This is the best shot they have. And I'm sending them to you for that very purpose. This is not evidence of your failure as a parent. I think it's evidence of your great potential as parents. And God knew that and sent these children to you. Well, verse 9, we get to the actual Samuel principle. Like I said, this was the verse that I really was trying to get this, cu this couple to in our discussion. But I hope you've seen how relevant the first eight verses are leading up to it. But here's where the rubber hits the road. Verse 9 consists of three parts that together constitute the Samuel principle. And the Lord says to Samuel, Now therefore, here's part one, hearken unto their voice. I already said that two verses ago, but I'm reiterating it because it doesn't seem like you're willing to accept that counsel. <laughs> You're going to do it by default, even if you don't do it by choice. They're going to choose. Okay? So, hearken. How be it yet? And that's where we put the brakes on. Because I think sometimes we go, oh, honor their agency? Okay, well, I'm going to have to. Then you do you. And sadly, that's the reigning philosophy that gets our children into this mess to begin with. Of just, there's no right or wrong. There's, it's all morally relativistic. Remember the problem in the book of Judges? There is no king and everybody does what's right according to their eyes. And so if that's the case, then of course we're going to honor agency. Uh, it's ironic that for a, an adversary that fought against agency in the war in heaven, that he blows the trumpet on agency all the time now, saying this is the best thing ever and no one should ever do anything to restrict someone's agency. No matter what, let them do anything and everything they want to. And you better not say a word against it. Oh, there's the challenges of cancel culture. And if you say a word against somebody else, then, then forget you. Well, that's only the first piece of advice. Hearken unto their voice. How be it yet, here's the other two pieces of advice I have for you. Two, protest solemnly unto them. And three, show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. In other words, yes, honor their agency, but also to let them know how you feel. In this, case, pro in this case, protest solemnly unto them because you know this is wrong, Samuel. I do too. It's between me and them, not you and them, but let them know where you're coming from and where you're, what side of the issue you're coming down on. Don't do that confrontationally or angrily. Don't do that contentiously because contention is not of me, the Lord says in 3 Nephi. That's of the devil. There goes the Holy Ghost, which was your only hope to begin with. But do let them know how you feel. And then third, show them the manner. In other words, help them see as best you can the future consequences of their present decision. You're at a fork in the road, son or daughter or mom or brother or whomever. You're at a fork in the road and I will honor whatever path you take. I'll do my best to make it a positive one any way that I can. But... I need you to know, at this moment of decision, I feel with all my heart that the other path, the one that you're rejecting or walking away from, is the path of happiness, of greater happiness, peace, and rest, to borrow from Abraham. And I just worry about where this other road leads. I see it paved with problems down the way. Maybe out of sight from where you are right now, but just from my vantage point and from a, a bit longer time on earth or a deeper understanding of scripture or whatever it might be, I just, I'm afraid that this is where this journey might lead. And that breaks my heart. 
choice is yours. Like I said at the beginning, I'm not, I'm not forcing you to go my way. I just want you to know, while you are embracing your truth and being fully authentic to it, and those are watchwords for the rising generation, will you please allow me to do likewise and own my truth and speak to my authentic self? Because it would be inauthentic of me not to let you know how I feel about this issue. Now that is one, like I said, gut-wrenching, contrary to proof. First great commandment pulling you in one direction, second great commandment pulling you in the other. And by and large, most of us fail at the Samuel principle because here's some nurture or nature for us. We're either wired for the first part or we're wired for the second. Hardly anybody is naturally wired for both. So, and we can even use Paul's phrase to the Ephesians, speaking the truth in love. Do you get the same thing from the Samuel principle? I'm going to tell you the truth. So I'm going to protest and try to show you the future. But I'm going to do it in love, which honors your agency. Uh, most people are either really good at speaking truth, but they stink at doing it in love, or they're really good at speaking in love, but they shy away from truth. You know those types? The first group will usually even admit it. They're like, hey, sorry if this hurts your feelings, but I'm a straight shooter and I just say it like it is. They'll say, it's like, hey, if this hurts your feelings, sorry, just deal with it. It's just the way I am. And you're like, well, yeah, but the way you are is kind of a jerk. You could have said the same thing in a lot softer, kinder language. And it actually probably would have had a better effect on me, to be honest. Or the flip side, I, I love you, I support you, I'm here for you, and I'm never going to say anything beyond that to let you know that it's actually devastating to me that you're going down this path. Whenever you see someone on social media, for example, visibly or vocally making a decision that's potentially controversial, uh, just look at the comments section. And it's an amazing chance to practice your discernment of where people are proving this contrary. And some come down only on love and don't say a word about law. And other people come down hard on law and none of it comes across as very loving. It is such a delicate balance. But it's one that we have to strive to strike and to do a better job of, yes, honoring agency and, yes, being true to the truths that we know. If you want another good example of it, because Samuel's going to do it textbook here. Nephi does it textbook in 1 Nephi chapter 7. When Laman and Lemuel are tying him up and say, we're going to go back to Jerusalem. And, and Nephi honors their agency. He even says it, if you will go up, okay, there's nothing I can do to stop you. I will hearken to your voice, if that's what you decide. How be it yet? And that's where Nephi does the other two things so beautifully. He lets them know how he feels. And he's even aware of his emotion. He does it in grief, not in anger. That's good. That's better. And as he lets them know where he stands on this, that I don't agree with your decision, I don't think it's the wise one, he then says he helps them see the future of their choice. He says, if you go back to Jerusalem, you will end up in its destruction, which will probably destroy you too. Now, thankfully, in that circumstance, together with some miracles from the hand of God, Laman and Lemuel do change their mind and end up making the right decision. But it is important that Nephi was willing to honor the wrong decision if they chose to make it. He just helped them act a little more wisely. And we can do the same. Now, with that, there's the council. And and Samuel then acts upon it. My suggestion to this couple was to act upon it as well. Strive for that balance. Seek the Lord's help. Everything that we saw in those first nine verses. But there in verse 10, Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked of him a king. There's what he's trying to protest solemnly unto them. It's based on everything I've studied, everything I've learned, everything I know all the words of the Lord unto me on this issue, let me give them to you. So you are functioning or deciding from a place of full understanding both sides of the issue. And I think, again, if we can do it non-confrontationally and we don't use our testimony as a club or our experiences as some kind of a cage, 
We can share with our loved ones our own spiritual experiences and impressions, our understanding of, of God's will and word, or even just what we've seen throughout history as what provides the most stable environment for society to function. Samuel is trying to do that. And then from verse 11 through 17, most of the rest of this chapter, he does the third part. He shows them the manner of the king. And it's not a very good manner. And sadly, it, it proves exactly correct, as we'll see in the, in the subsequent chapters. But he says, you want a king? Fine, you're going to have one. But this is how he'll end up. He will end up enlisting your sons into his army and sending them off to war. He will take your daughters and sons into servitude to provide for him. He will tax you to death so he can provide for himself at your expense. Uh, that's just kind of the way things typically work. Again, Book of Mormon, think King Noah here. Well, what are they going to do with all of this in mind? Samuel warns them one last time in verse 18. And ye shall cry out in that day because of your king, which ye shall have chosen you, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. And that seems fitting, since you wouldn't listen to him in all these prior days. So buyer beware. You may end up with buyer's remorse. But, verse 19, nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. They said, nay, but we will have a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. All those things that God had done for them in the past and would continue to do for them in the future if they would only be faithful to him. But no, we just want to be like everyone else. And in this social media-driven environment, especially among the rising generation that wants so desperately to fit in, we're up against culture itself. And no wonder many of them refused to obey. So verse 21, Samuel heard all the words of the people. He rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, hearken unto their voice and make them a king. And so Samuel does. Now, it's not enough to, honor, to offer to honor their agency and then not actually follow through with it. No, he said it in 7, he repeats it in 9, and now he's actually going to do it in 21. You, we said we would. That's one of the things that amazes me about the father of the prodigal son. Speaking of honoring a wayward child's agency. When the son comes to dad and says, I want the inheritance, you can picture dad going, I don't know if you know how inheritances work. You don't get that until after I'm dead. So I know exactly how inheritances work, father. And I want mine now. But that, that means you like, you're treating me like, uh-huh, and I want it now. I'm amazed that the father honored the son's agency. And did whatever he needed to do to liquidate assets or sell half the farm or do whatever and act as one dead to give his son half of the inheritance. Now notice, by the way, the father does not follow the son to that far country. He can't. See, the dad is trying to live the, the Samuel principle. I will honor your agency, but, but I can't follow you down that path. I know that it's wrong. But here is your half. And believe me, I will be waiting and watching for you to come over the crest of the hill and I'll come running the moment I see you. There's something powerful here of, of saying I'll support you and meaning it, even when your heart is broken in, in the process. Because then what amazes me most about this is as we turn to chapter 9, Saul is chosen, and as we'll see in this chapter, he's the best possible candidate for king, at least among that generation. And, I mean, honestly, if it were me, you, know, you want a king? Fine. Oh, I'll give you a king. In fact, I will make it a self-fulfilling prophecy. I told you you'll end up with a bad king. Let me make sure that's the case. I'm going to find the worst imaginable one and throw him in your face so that it forces you to deal with the negative consequences of your idiotic decision. Oh, there's, there went the Spirit. No, instead, because of God's mercy, His grace, His generosity, I do not agree with your decision. But not only will I honor it, but I will honor you and my relationship and love for you by doing my very best to mitigate the circumstances 
to almost do the opposite of a self-fulfilling prophecy. I'm going to do my best to help you avoid the future that I, I see in the distance because I really don't want it to come. And so together with those limits, let me pour out my love. Together with my protest, let me offer you the best I have to offer. And that's exactly what happens here. Chapter 9, verse 1, there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, uh, the son of Abiel of Zehor Berochat. It goes through all of his ancestry, but it describes Kish as a mighty man of power. This is good lineage here, okay? Good stock. And he, Kish, had a son whose name was Saul. So here's the one that we're looking for. He's described in these words, a choice young man. So far, so good. A goodly there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. From his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of the people. Like I said, God is going for the very best he can. I don't agree with your decision, but I'll try to make it work for your sake. And so here's it comes from good stock. Uh, mighty man is his dad. So he's probably growing up with similar pos uh, potential. He's choice and goodly. Now, in the Old Testament, goodly means handsome. And that actually makes me a little nervous because if, if I'm an Israelite and I want to fit in with everybody else, and how does it look out there? Is it outward appearances that I'm drawn to? That's what, that's what worries me. Because the superlatives that you see here, goodlier than anyone else and shoulders and above, higher than anyone, those are physical attributes. This guy is a giant among men. Ooh, that'll come in handy if a giant from Gath ever comes. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, Goliath. Okay, we're, we're getting there soon. He's goodlier. He's the best looking candidate of them all. Now, is that all we're looking for, though? That is something I worry about. Mere physical attractiveness and physical size. Are we just looking for outward charisma? Or are we looking a little bit deeper? Now, as the story in chapter 9 proceeds, Saul's father, this mighty man of power, well, wasn't powerful enough to keep his donkeys under control. They have wandered off and were lost, and so he sends his son, Saul, he's, he's trustworthy, go find these donkeys and bring them back. Bring a servant with you, in case you need some help. And so he goes and he does it. He's out there searching uh, uh, so long and so hard, he, he's unsuccessful at it, but he starts worrying about his dad. And so Saul says to the servant, I'll bet by now dad's probably more worried about us than he's worried about his donkeys. So we should probably go home and reassure him that all is still well with us. Sorry we haven't succeeded in our mission. I actually love what I'm seeing in Saul here. It goes beyond he's handsome and tall. Uh, it, instead, it's Oh, here's someone that is willing to diligently strive to accomplish his father's will. Hmm, sound like a type and shadow of Christ? I think so. This is someone who is, has good judgment because he's being sensitive to the feelings of others. What might dad be worried about right now? Are priorities shifting? Good judgment can make those kinds of adjustments on the fly. And Saul seems to be doing that. Well, the servant, before they give up, says, well, okay, I, I get where you're coming from. You're probably right. But I, I've heard that there's a holy man of God who lives here in this town that we've been searching for the donkeys in. And maybe he can get some idea from God where they might be. And Saul thinks that's a good idea, except for the fact that he has nothing to offer this man of God. I didn't, I didn't bring anything to give, so I have no offering. I can make no sacrifice. I, I like that in Saul, too. I'm not feeling entitled well, I'm tall enough. I can look down on him and say, come on, you owe me something. I, no, there's no entitlement. In fact, there's a sense of, of stewardship or humility. Like, I, if I'm going to go seek a blessing from the hand of God's servant, I should have something in my hand to offer him. And what is my offering? What is my sacrifice? I have nothing to give. There's some humility on his part. Now, the servant says, well, I actually have a few shekels. And that's probably enough to just give him something by way of gratitude. And Saul says, okay, great, sounds, sounds wonderful. You see, Saul recognizes the spiritual gifts of this man of God that he hasn't even met yet. Also recognizes the, the temporal gift of a mere servant. And doesn't feel oh, threatened that someone below him has something that in a way puts him above. That's going to change later, but hold on to this thought for now. Even servants have something to offer, 
and I'm not too big to deny him offering that. And so they go in search of this man of God. Well, guess who it happens to be? Yes, it's none other than Samuel himself, who's been making the rounds throughout Israel like he did at the end of of last week's material. Now, verse 15, the Lord had told Samuel in his ear, and that seems right for Samuel, since, since a boy he was saying, speak for thy servant heareth, right? Well, God is still speaking to him. He's still hearing. He, and this word came to Samuel a day before Saul came. So this is prophecy. This is happening in advance. The Lord said to, to Samuel, tomorrow about this time, I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin. And thou shalt anoint him to be captain over my people Israel, that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people, because their cry is come unto me. Now that sounds a lot like God speaking to Moses. I have heard the cry of my people Israel in Egyptian bondage, and I am calling you to be their deliverer. In this case, I see, I hear, I'm aware of what Israel is going through and what they want, and I'll honor their agency through you. And so go, this is the man I have called and appointed. Well, I appoint, I need you to anoint. And if you remember anoint, uh, to be a captain, great words here. Anoint is what you do with oil and what you do for a king or a priest. Christ is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And so no wonder he's the anointed one, or as they say in Hebrew, the Mashiach, the Messiah. No wonder he's the Christos, as they say in Greek, or the Christ. All those words, Messiah, Christ, just mean the anointed one. And now Saul is going to be that anointed one. He's going to be the captain over Israel. And who's the captain of our salvation? None other than Jesus. Uh, He's going to save my people. Ah, we need a savior here. So many types and shadows of Jesus Christ. Then in verse 17, when Samuel saw Saul for the first time, the Lord said unto him, Behold the man whom I spake to thee of. This same shall reign over my people. You found your guy, Samuel. So move forward. In 18, Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate, place of judgment, and said, Tell me, I pray thee, where the seer's house is. And Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. You you found me. Go up before me unto the high place, for ye shall eat with me today, and tomorrow I will let thee go, and will tell thee all that is in thine heart. Oh, and by the way, don't worry about those donkeys that you came searching for. They wandered back to your father and all is well. We're good. Okay. Now that would have blown Saul away because it's like, wait, wait, how, how did you know? what? Who, who are you? Okay. This is amazing. This is the first time they've met, laid eyes on each other. Saul hasn't said a thing about the donkeys yet. And yet Saul, Samuel knows exactly what's on Saul's mind. In fact, he knows exactly what's in Saul's heart because that's what he says at the end. Come back tomorrow so I can tell you everything that's in your heart. It's one thing to say, I got a lot on my mind and in my heart, I've been thinking about you and just feeling about what Israel needs in a king. So I wanted to share some stuff. No, it's not my heart. It's yours that I want to introduce to you, which suggests an incredible gift of discernment on Samuel's part. Oh, he had that gift. My wife has that gift in ways that are far beyond what I have. And I'm amazed and blessed by her ability just to understand where people are coming from. Uh, Elder Richard G. Scott had that gift in spades. He's the one that always stared into the camera at general conference and cried repentance. And boy, did it feel like he was searching my soul as he did so. I was actually in the Timpanogos temple once and sat down in the chapel waiting for a session. And an older gentleman comes in, sit down next to me. And I look and I'm like, oh, hello, hello, the Elder Scott. It was him. And I didn't have a TV screen between us to protect me. Man, it felt like he was looking through my soul. And it was amazing as we both got up and went into the endowment session together and sat side by side again. And halfway through, he leaned over and just said, it's good to be with you here, Jared. It's good to be with you. I didn't know how to respond to that. (laughs) But just to feel known and seen and discerned by someone with an incredible gift of discernment. Elder Robert L. Simpson was a member of the 70 years ago, and he shared a story when he first met David O. McKay. He said, President McKay came, and first time he met him, he just shook his hand and just held it for an uncomfortable, an uncomfortable length of time. Put his, arm, his hand up on Brother Simpson's shoulder and just looked into his soul through the eye. And uh, President McKay said to him after a time, 
Brother Simpson, it's good to know you. And Brother Simpson was struck because he said, he didn't say it's nice to meet you. He said, it's good to know you. And I think he did. In fact, a few months later, President McKay called Brother Simpson and said, you know, ever since our interview, I, can't, I just can't stop thinking about you. And it's like, wait, that was an interview? Uh, a handshake and a look in the eye? Whoa, okay. And President McKay said, yeah, since the interview, I just, uh, you're the man that the Lord wants to serve as a mission president, and he called him to preside over a mission. Th that gift of discernment really is a, a powerful thing, and Samuel has it. Better than that, he's hoping Saul will be able to develop it, because notice what happens next. Verse 20, Samuel says to Saul, And on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on thee and on all thy father's house? It's like, you're the man. You're the one that's going to be leading Israel. Saul responds, Am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel? And my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Wherefore then speakest thou so to me? This is the same sense of inadequacy that Moses felt when called, that Enoch felt when called, that Gideon felt when, when called. This is overwhelming. But the way that Saul says it, I'm a Benjamite. You remember the end of Judges with that horrific story of the, the rape and murder of the Levite's concubine? And that the whole house of Israel came out and practically annihilated the tribe of Benjamin? Well, this is the least now being elevated to the greatest. But I'm just a Benjamite. There's hardly any of us. And even among us, my family is the least of all the families in Benjamin. Well, no, your father's actually a, a mighty man. Well, yeah, I guess comparatively speaking, but we're nobodies. Not in God's eyes. So change the way you view yourself, Saul. Samuel then invites Saul to eat with him and then go on the rounds throughout Israel, kind of like a senior apostle bringing a junior apostle with him to, to get him up to speed. And then in verse 27, as they, were going down to, as they were going down to the end of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Bid the servant pass on before us. And he passed on. But stand thou still a while, that I may show thee the word of God. Uh, we saw a similarity to Moses in the sense of inadequacy. Well, here's a parallel to the burning bush. And, and Samuel wants to, to light it. He's saying to Saul, let's turn aside and see for a while. Stay here. Tarry. Stand still so I can show you the word of God. Truly coming to understand God's word, being able to see it the way he's describing it, Yes, it requires stillness, patience, pondering on our part. But boy, is that stillness well rewarded. And so it was for Saul. That's where you get chapter 10, where Saul is finally anointed as that anointed one. Verse 1, Samuel took a vial of oil, oil, olive oil, symbolic of Gethsemane, the olive press, weight coming down to crush it and bring out this life-giving substance. Saul takes, or Samuel takes the vial of oil, poured it upon Saul's head, and kissed him, and said, Is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? There's those two words again. Anointed, Messiah, Christ, captain. Samuel then prophesies several things that will soon happen to Saul, and they do, including meeting a company of prophets. He says in verse 6, And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shall be turned into another man. And let it be, when these signs are coming to thee, that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. That's a great verse. Once the Spirit descends, you will be different. You won't be the old Saul. You'll be a new one. I think that's why Saul to Paul is such a perfect name change in the New Testament. Because he became truly a new man. And that's what God intends for this Old Testament, Saul. I even like how he says at the end of it, once this happens, then do as occasion serve thee. God will be with you. You'll have the spirit. You'll be different. You'll have the mind of Christ, the, the Im his image in your countenance. You'll have a, a new made heart within you, new desires, new thoughts and perspectives. And so whatever situation you find yourself in, do as the occasion serve thee. 
I, I, to me, that's a sense of God's confidence in us in terms of delegating responsibility and honoring agency, this time because he knows we'll use it well, because the Spirit has turned us into someone more like him. That is a transformation I pray for, so I can trust myself better in decision-making, knowing that God trusts me because he's turned me into someone more like him. Samuel then tells him to go down to Gilgal and wait there seven days until he, Samuel, arrives. He's going to offer some sacrifices once he gets there. Verse 8, he says, Seven days shalt thou tarry till I come to thee and show thee what thou shalt do. That seems to be true to form a lot of times when God is guiding us. He'll give us, I mean, what's the line in the hymn? One step enough for me. Here, Samuel's giving Saul a few steps. Go to Gilgal. Wait there for seven days. Then I'll come and give you further instructions. But I do hope that you'll be obedient in the meantime. Sometimes it is line upon line, precept, and then a few precepts more, based on what you do with what I've already given you. We're going to see that tested a few times. Saul then goes. He meets this company of prophets, just as Samuel prophesied. And in verse 10, sure enough, the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. Now, he didn't consider himself a prophet. People are going to start wondering, is he? Because he sure looks like one, sounds like one now. But it is amazing that if we borrow, for example, the definition of the spirit of prophecy from the book of Revelation, namely that it's the testimony of Jesus, here are these prophets, these men of God, bearing witness of the God of Israel. And as Saul is among them, so he's in good company, okay? And then the spirit comes upon him. So he's got great horizontal companions and the ultimate vertical companion. Good neighbors, connection with God. And what ends up happening? When when we are surrounded by people of faith and testimony, and when the Spirit touches our hearts the way it touched theirs, then we will find ourselves testifying right alongside them. That's the experience for you converts. It's amazing to watch it unfold. Then in verse 11, And it came to pass when all that knew him before time saw that, behold, he prophesied among the prophets. Then the people said one to another, what is this that is come unto the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? I mean, I knew he was head and shoulders above the rest as far as physical stature, but spiritual strength? What? Who is this guy? And what I love about that is new creatures in Christ are sometimes unrecognizable to people who only knew the previous version of that person. I've said before, my wife was totally inactive from 15 to 20. And I sometimes have this kind of just mental exercise of what would it be like to meet somebody who only knew her then and has lost touch and doesn't know about any of the incredible transformations the Lord has affected in her life. And I just picture them thinking, wait, you married who? Yeah, where where'd you guys get married? Oh, in the temple. Wait, one of our temples? I never would have pictured her. What? You obviously... Are we talking about the same person? Evidently, no. Even though... Oh, same birth certificate. Uh, same, same physical person. But someone spiritually completely remade. And that's the power, the transformative power of the atonement of Jesus Christ. Don't underestimate it in your own life or in the lives of those that you were thinking about when we were studying 1 Samuel chapter 8. There is power here. And for them to say, is this really the son of Kish? Is Saul, he's just different than he's ever been. Well, that's the power of the Spirit with you. Samuel then gathers the people and says to them in verse 18, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt and delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all kingdoms and of them that oppressed you. Now, what he's saying, the the incumbent, by the way, has had a pretty impressive track record. God has been good to you. But ye have this day rejected your God, who himself saved you out of all your adversities and your tribulations. And ye have said unto him, Nay, but set a king over us. Now, therefore, present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. Now, I get a sense that Samuel is still pretty frustrated by the people here. 
he didn't, didn't, he never agreed with their choice. But again, we see that he is at least honoring it as his God. Samuel then narrows the field from tribe down to family to individual, kind of like Joshua did with Achan, finding out who was the guilty. Well, in this one, who's the anointed? And he calls for Saul. Now, this is, we, we saw the, the, end of the drama unfold in the story of Achan. It's this group, and then this group, and then narrows it down, and then boom, it's you. Well, you can sense similar drama. I'm here to anoint the new king. And then you picture all of Israel like, oh, who's it going to be? It's someone from Benjamin. What, really? Benjamin? Of all tribes? Them? The small? Okay. Wow. Of all the families in Benjamin, this family. And slowly whittles it down as the, the, the intensity and the emotion increases. Anticipation, right? And then what happens? It's Saul. You know, drum roll. It's Saul. And the, the, you picture the spotlight turn. And he's nowhere to be found. <laughs> and, they're like, well, wait. and I said, it's Saul. And again, symbol crash, and he's not there. In verse 22, Therefore they inquired of the Lord further, if the man should yet come thither. And the Lord answered, Behold, he hath hid himself among the stuff. <laughs> I just laughed like, I still can't do it. Um, I know that the prophet has called me. I know that he has discerned in me. Uh, uh, abilities, attributes that I don't even think I have myself. I felt the Spirit descend upon me. I'm feeling different. I prophesied among prophets. Who am I? But I can't be king. And so he goes and hides himself. But God knows where he is. Good luck hiding from the all-seeing eye. Uh, ask Adam and Eve about that one, right? But in this case, hiding yourself among the stuff? I, I worry sometimes we do likewise that we are overwhelmed by our own sense of inadequacy, or we read our patriarchal blessing and think, there's no way that applies to me. I, I can never be that good. And so we go find some stuff to hide behind. What kind of stuff? It could be excuses. It could be, oh, lesser priorities. It could be distraction or diversion, or I just don't have time to be able to accept this calling or to serve in this role because I just have too much stuff going on. Well, are we hiding behind that stuff? Verse 23, and they ran and fetched him thence. <laughs> get, get, get out here. Your, your name's been called. And when he stood among the people, he was higher than any of the people from his shoulders and upward. Like I said, head and shoulders above the rest. It is hard to hide a giant. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. Don't put your light under a bushel. Do we know who we are? Has the Lord convinced us of our own divine potential? Then, then don't hide. Let your light so shine. Verse 24, Samuel then says to all the people, See ye him whom the Lord hath chosen, that there is none like him among all the people? And all the people shouted and said, God save the king. Sounds like Samuel's equivalent of the counsel to Joshua. Be strong and have a good courage. It's like Samuel, excuse me, Saul, you're the one God has chosen. You got this. And the people are shouting for him. All is, everyone's behind him. You can do this. This anointing event then ends. We might call it a coronation. And everybody goes their separate ways. Verse 26, Saul also went home to Gibeah. And there went with him a band of men whose hearts God had touched. But the children of Belial said, How shall this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no presents. But he, Saul, held his peace. And that always seems to be the case. Following God, some did, some didn't. Following God's chosen servants, well, some do, some don't. And what makes the difference? Well, it's has the Spirit of God touched your heart. It actually says a lot about the kind of leader you are look and see what kind of people tend to follow you. In this case, it was people God had touched were following Saul. That's a good sign for them and a good sign for Saul. And who rejects him? Well, these sons of Belial, these people that don't want to have anything to do with God or his servants. Well, that tells you something about them and something about Saul also. But I do love Saul's reaction. To those that denied or rejected him, he simply held his peace. And I think that's typically the best way to approach your detractors. Just turn the other cheek. Jesus did. Just oh, remember the Samaritan village that rejected him and 
the sons of thunder, James and John, wanted to call down thunder and lightning to destroy them. We'll see something similar here in just a moment. But no, Jesus says, what spirit is moving you? <laughs> Let's just go somewhere else. And Saul seems to have that same level of calm self-assurance. It's okay. I'll hold my peace. Now, will he maintain that calm self-assurance in the face of detractors? Time will tell. And that's something we need to keep an eye, an eye out for. But chapter 11, first. Saul, this is a good moment, okay? He's ready to move forward. and He rallies Israel to the cause. In chapter 11, it's the Ammonites that are coming up to war against them. They attack an Israelite city. And when the Israelites make an offer of surrender... The Ammonites say, oh, sure, yeah, we'll accept your surrender as long as you let us come in and put all your right eyes out. Well, that doesn't sound very uh, promising. So they say, well, let's think about it for a while. Um, yikes. Uh, give us a few days and we'll see what we decide. And during that time period, they send servants out, messengers, to, to anyone can help us, please come to our rescue. And when Saul hears about it, he realizes, well... This is my time to stand strong. And he reacts very swiftly, very strongly. The moment he hears it, this is no longer him hiding behind the stuff. You really do see the spirits upon him. He has followers. I'm ready to move forward. And he does. Verse 6, the spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard those tidings. His anger was kindled greatly. Now, we're going to see later that anger is one of Saul's defining characteristics. And later in life, it's going to get him into trouble. Here, it's actually a good thing. This is a defining emotion that is put to good use. We could probably even call this anger righteous indignation. Okay, But be, again, be aware of whatever emotions are moving you and, and make sure that you're, being, you're putting them to good use. In verse 7, this is what Saul does. He took a yoke of oxen and hewed them in pieces and sent them throughout all the coasts of Israel by the hands of messengers, saying, Whosoever cometh not forth after Saul and after Samuel, so shall it be done unto his oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell on the people, and they came out with one consent. You remember again that horrifying story at the end of Judges, where the Levite, whose concubine was raped and murdered, cuts the body up into pieces and sends it out throughout Israel to gather them, to help them see just what they've allowed to take place within their borders. Well, I don't know if Saul is drawing upon that playbook or simply trying to help, again, rally the troops, and, but takes these yoke of, this yoke of oxen, chops it up and sends it out and says, this is what's coming down your way. If we don't unite, if we don't stand together, we will all hang separately, right, Benjamin Franklin? Uh, we have to come together to fight our common enemies. And they come running. We saw in the pride cycles of the book of Judges, often it was, you know, who's the enemy of the, of the day, and who's the judge, and what tribe, and where are they fighting? It, they seem to be, by and large, localized kinds of things. Whereas here, we really start to see a unifying of the house of Israel. We will see that in the reigns of Samuel, excuse me, Saul, and David, and Solomon. Then things fall apart, but wait a, a week or two for that to come. Here, the tribes are coming together, and Saul is their leader. They know it, so does he. So he leads the armies of Israel against the Ammonites, totally defeats them. In verse 12, the people said unto Samuel, who is he that said, shall Saul reign over us? Bring the men that we may put them to death. And Saul said, oh, easy tiger. There shall not a man be put to death this day, for today the Lord hath wrought salvation in Israel. Now, again, chapter 11 doesn't require much of our time or attention, but just those stories are important to help put in perspective what we're about to see through so much of the rest of Samuel's story. Because again, it's, it's emotion in check. He's reining in his passions. He's bridling them, okay? And here, when he's, he's just been uh, victorious in battle, and now that it's more obvious that this is the right guy for the job, and he's leading us to victory, and he's uniting the tribes of Israel, then people start looking back at those that rejected him. It's like, why didn't you follow him from the start? We should go back and kill those guys. Again, it's the sons of thunder. And yet, calmly, just like Christ, Saul is saying, what spirit is moving you? No, 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 no. No one's going to be put to death 
there's already been enough death. Thankfully, it was among our enemies. We're not going, I have no enemies here in Israel. If they didn't accept me at the start, I can't blame them. I didn't accept myself at the start. I grew into that. Let them grow into it too. So no pride, no, no vanity, no jealousy. It's not about me. It's about God. Look at what the Lord has done. Can we just honor that and move forward? Oh, if only Saul could have held to that when he was moving forward. We'll see that fall apart shortly. But chapter 12 first, this is where Samuel ends up reproving and exhorting the people because he's nearing the end of his ministry and he needs to call repent, cry repentance one more time. He says to all Israel, I'm old, you now have a king, so I'm passing the baton and you're ready for my final exhortation. I'm also ready for my final accounting, my final stewardship interview. In verse 2 of chapter 12, he says, I have walked before you from my childhood unto this day. Behold, here I am, witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Whose ass have I taken? Whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? Or of whose hand have I received any bribe to blind mine eyes therewith? I will restore it you. Am I guilty of any of the things that my sons have been guilty of? No. Guilty of any of the things that Hophni and Phinehas, my counterparts from previously, were guilty of? No, none. Basically, Samuel is saying, I have a conscience void of offense toward God and toward all men. And if I have defrauded anyone, tell me, I'll make it right. Spencer W. Kimball actually did that when he was called to the Quorum of the Twelve. He was a businessman in Arizona, and he went back to all of his business associates and trading partners or anyone he worked with and just asked, let them know, I am being called I'm retiring early, way early, and I've been called to a position within my church that I feel horribly inadequate for myself. But I just want to make sure I'm right with God, vertical, and right with my neighbor, horizontal. So if in our years of business, doing business together, if you feel like I've ever shortchanged you or not been completely fair, trust me, it was never intentional on my part. But if you feel that you've been wronged in any way, please tell me, and I will make it right, right here. And he did. Samuel is saying, I'm ready to do likewise. In verse 4, their response, Thou hast not defrauded us, nor oppressed us, neither hast thou taken aught of any man's hand. So we agree with you. You are blameless. Verse 6, Samuel then says to the people, It is the Lord that advanced Moses and Aaron, and that brought your fathers up out of the land of Egypt. Now therefore stand still that I may reason with you before the Lord of all the righteous acts of the Lord, which he did to you and to your fathers. See, Samuel had been his own counsel and had defended himself before the people. Now he's going to become defense attorney for God and say, if you've ever had hard feelings or thought that God wasn't there for you, let me reason with you. And let me show you all of his righteous acts throughout our history. I sometimes feel moved to do something similar, as I, especially when I teach the Old Testament, because so many people tend to misjudge God by their view of what happens in the Old Testament. And if we can just reason together, as we've been doing for the past few months, if I can show you a few insights or put some things in context or, or help draw out what seems to go unnoticed, then I think you will know all the righteous acts of God towards his people throughout all this time period. So what does Samuel do? He goes and reviews their history. He walks them through the various rounds of the pride cycle during the period of the judges that he emerged out of. And now, sadly, you've chosen to have a king. So he says in verse 14, If ye will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall both ye and also the king that reigneth over you continue following the Lord your God. But, on the other hand, if ye will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall the hand of the Lord be against you as it was against your fathers. So this is less about the specific form of government, king or no king, and actually more about your relationship with God. Well, like I said, King Benjamin was fine. Kings like him, keep the kings. 
The difference is, are people going, are your leaders going to help you be righteous or lead you away? And as Samuel is reasoning with them and laying it all out before them, the choice really is yours. Forget type of government. How about type of self-governance? And will you be righteous or wicked? Will you follow God or reject him? Then to emphasize all that he's teaching, kind of put the, his closing arguments and actually let God make the closing argument himself. He calls upon God to send thunder and rain as one last piece of evidence, even though this is the dry season, which would make it all the more miraculous. Sure enough, later that day, thunder and rain, and the people begin pleading with Samuel. Now that it's totally obvious and they have their proof. Verse 19, pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God, that we die not. For we have added unto all our sins this evil to ask us a king. There's that buyer's remorse I was talking about. And the bad stuff hasn't even started happening yet. But there they have evidence of the powerful hand of God. And if they were ever doubting before, which seems to be why they turned to a more tangible king, now they've got some tangible evidence that the king of kings would have continued to lead them if they would have been willing to have him. Now they realize we've done something wrong. And in addition to all the wickedness of our ancestors and all the stupid things we've done through the pride cycles, now we've dug ourselves even deeper into a hole by asking for a king. Is it too late to go back now that Saul is anointed? And yet that's where I love the end of chapter 12. It's beautiful. It's Samuel's response. And it is powerful because it displays how God feels or how parents feel or how priesthood leaders or teacher, just loved ones feel when you've made a mistake and you finally start to recognize that. I think the end of chapter 12 is a good sequel to what we saw back in chapter 8 from the Samuel principle. And it's not God going neener neener or Samuel saying, I told you so, or you made your bed, now lie in it. No, this isn't the father of the prodigal son slamming the door behind him or yelling out the door or yelling out the window after him. Don't ever come back because you treated me like I'm dead. So you're dead to me. There's none of that in, in this. So notice these last five or six verses in verse 20. Fear not. You have done all this wickedness. Yeah. Okay. Yet turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. See what Samuel is saying there? Don't beat yourself up over past mistakes. Leave them in, in the past. Leave them behind you. Just make better decisions here. And you can serve the Lord with all your heart. In verse 21, Turn ye not aside, for then should ye go after vain things which cannot profit nor deliver. They are vain. Learn from your mistakes and just be wiser. It's okay. It's a school of hard knocks. And yeah, tuition is steep. But I, you can have a glorious future. And now that you've learned to discern between things of value and things of vanity, I'm excited to see the choices you'll make from here. In verse 22, For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it hath pleased the Lord to make you his people. God loves you despite yourselves. He chose you. And, he, and you remain chosen if you'll just begin choosing him. So let bygones be bygones. Yes, you have a king. God can work with you through a king. He's given you the best that he can. Just give him your best also. Verse 23, Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. But I will teach you the good and the right way. See, back in 22, it was God who hasn't given up on you. In 23, I haven't given up on you either. And for Samuel, it's, it would be sinful of me to just rub in the fact that you've sinned. It would be wrong of me to just leave you to your own devices. And no, I'm going to pray for you. And I will keep teaching you. I'll never give up on that. And then verse 24 and 25. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things he hath done for you. But if you shall still do wickedly, ye shall be consumed, both ye and your king. There's Samuel trying to strike that same balance, proving contraries, truth in love. There's carrot and stick. 
Consider the great things God has done. There's these blessings that lie before you. And if you do wickedness, oh, you'll be consumed. There's the stick behind, just waiting for consequences. But the choice is theirs. And how you live is totally up to you moving forward. I'll be praying. I'll be teaching. God will be there helping you every step of the way. The future looks bright as long as they are faithful. But 1 Samuel chapter 13, we start to see things begin to fall apart. It doesn't take long. It begins with Saul in the driver's seat. He's been reigning now as king for several years. Uh, there's a new enemy attacking. We saw the Ammonites a little while ago. Now it's the Philistines. They're back. And they boast a massive army. In verse 6, when the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people were distressed, then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits. I guess they didn't have all of Saul's stuff to hide behind, but they found hiding places wherever they could. They just anything to avoid the enemy because there's no way we can overcome them. Well, as for Saul, in verse 8, he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. This sounds familiar. Before it was, wait seven days and I'll go and I'll meet you and I'll tell you. That was years before. Uh, that, I don't know if that's just Samuel's uh, MO, the way he normally does things. I'll meet you there. Be patient. Is God trying Saul's patience? Well, if he is, Saul fails here because notice what happens next. Samuel came not to Gilgal. At least not within the seven days that, that Saul was expecting him. And the people were scattered from him, from Saul. So here's the issue. I mean, it's one thing to just wait around and be patient when nothing's trying your patience. But what happens when your back's against the wall? What happens when there's an enemy looming and looming larger and larger the longer time goes on? And what happens when the people that are with you start to wonder and question and, and leave? Because now time is not my friend, it's my enemy too. And, and the longer time goes on, the, the less I've got on my side. Can I still be patient then? During times of stress or panic? In verse 9, Saul is unable to. He says, bring hither a burnt offering to me and peace offerings. And he, as in Saul, offered the burnt offering. Not Samuel, who has the authority to do so. This is a separation of church and state here. And Saul, your state, Samuel's church. And only Samuel can offer the sacrifices. But no, Saul takes that authority upon himself because I'm out of time. And I can't wait, for, I can't wait to do it right. So can I do the right thing in the wrong way? Or the wrong thing in the right way? I don't know which is which. But under the circumstances, isn't this okay? Well, verse 10 it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. I oh, mean, you couldn't write the script better. Right on time. Well, right after right on time. But it was so close. Saul, if you had only waited a little while longer. I think our problem is we... We assume that the finish line is so far away that we're justified in giving up early. There's no way I can endure to the end when the end is out of sight. No, oh, Saul, it's so close. And if you just could have held on for a little longer, if you could have resisted the temptation for just a little longer, your circumstances would have changed and the intensity of the temptation would have lessened and you would have been fine. If you just would have waited a little longer, the miracle would have come through. But you gave up hope because you gave up patience. So verse 11, Samuel says, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Well, because I saw that the people were scattered from me, so it's the people's fault, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, so it's your fault, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash, there, so it's the enemy's fault. You see the problem here? He doesn't say anything about himself. I mean, I'm, I'm innocent. I was doing what, I, what needed to be done. Uh, the, the people and you and the Philistines, everyone was conspiring against me. I had no other choice. Verse 12, therefore said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. See, I, I didn't want to. 
I'm with you. I want to do the right thing. I just, I, I had to. Because, I mean, the right thing was including God in the battle. You, of all people, would agree with that, Samuel, right? And so I needed to invite God to join us. And how is that done? Through offering sacrifice. And so it, it had to be done. And who to do it but me? Well, that's the problem. It wasn't you. It was me. I told you I'd come. I did. You needed to wait and be patient, faithful, obedient. Verse 13, Samuel says to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever, if you would have been that, the type that God could have trusted. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. God wants people with hearts like his. Why do you think he changed your heart when the Spirit came down upon you and you were prophesying amidst the prophets? But you've slid back a bit. You're not who you once were. And, and God will take the kingdom from you to give the kingdom to someone he can trust. Someone whose heart is a little closer to his with patience and faith and obedience and trust. Still, the war continued, and yes, the Philistines were so much better equipped and armed, so what are we going to do? Uh, I'm the king now. You say it's going to pass to somebody else. Fine, but in the meantime, actually not fine. I, oh, but in the meantime, what am I supposed to do? And I've got to get my armies up and, and going, and I've got to fight the Philistines, and, and I could you still use the help of God. In fact, consider this, what he's up against in verse 19. Now there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel. No blacksmiths, that is. No one to be able to hammer out swords and shields and armor. For the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make them swords or spears. But all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share and his coulter and his axe and his mattock, which are all farming tools. So yes, the Israelites have farming tools, but they have, seem to have no military weapons. And even to sharpen their plows and to sharpen their, their pruning shears, they have to go down to the Philistines because the Philistines are the ones that have the equipment and the know-how. They have the smiths, the blacksmiths, to do this. Now, there's, there's a problem here. You have not prepared yourself or provided for yourself well because you are at the mercy of other people, and those people might end up being your enemies at some point. I mean, Brigham Young was huge on this in early Pioneer Utah, where it was like, we've got to be able to provide for ourselves so that we're not dependent upon the Gentiles, since the Gentiles are the ones that keep kicking us out of state after state after state. We need to be self-sufficient. Well, here ancient Israel was anything but, and they depended upon their enemies, and no wonder they have no, no weapons of their own. Picture a Philistine going, wait, you want me to make you a sword? What are you, who are you going to use that on? No, I'll... I'll sharpen your plow so you can eat, but I'm not going to give you something you can fight me with. There's a problem here. There's, I think, some ways a, a problem among us if we become too reliant upon the world for the things that we, the, the, the ways we, we look at life, the, way, the things that we're learning. The, we just need to be careful and be a little bit more self-sufficient because the world that we depend upon usually doesn't have our best interest at heart. So notice what happens, verse 22. It came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan. That's Jonathan is Saul's son. We'll see more of him in a moment. But with Saul and with Jonathan his son was there found. So somehow the king and the prince, they have weapons, but the people don't. Now that's not going to be much of an army. Uh, it's one thing if I'm in charge that, oh, well, I'm good. Is this an every man for himself kind of moment? And it's not enough for leaders to be ready for battle because leaders alone can't win. It takes the followers to be similarly armed. So if we look at President Nelson or President Oaks or President Irene, if we look at the Quorum of the Twelve and auxiliary presidencies in the church and just see just how strong their shield of faith is and just how sharp the sword of the Spirit is in their hands, that's insufficient if we haven't armed ourselves as well. 
And so we better have a lookout for the smiths among us. Now here there's actually a wonderful play on that word for Latter-day Saints who have testimonies of Joseph Smith. Now Isaiah is going to make this even more clear when it talks about the Lord using a smith. Don't get ahead of yourself. I wouldn't consider this nor that a direct allusion to Joseph Smith per se. I think it could be interpreted that way, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't require every biblical reader to see that. They would consider that a stretch. But the name Smith, is, it grows out of this kind of occupation. In the old days when your last name was simply where you were from or who your dad was or what you did for a living, no wonder the name Smith became so common as a last name. Because yes, there's blacksmiths and goldsmiths and silversmiths and smiths are just people that are hammering things out and taking raw material and making something useful out of it. Now, that's a pretty good description of the smith we have in mind when we speak of Brother Joseph. In fact, I remember reading a book years ago by G.K. Chesterton, great th Catholic thinker, early 20th century. And he was talking about the, la the last name Smith for some reason. But the way he described it was so awesome. And it made me think of the prophet, obviously. But it also made me think of things like this in 1 Samuel of life is hard if you have no smiths among you. If you don't have people that can hammer metal into something workable, useful, helpful, then you're in a world to hurt yourself. I am grateful for a smith like Joseph who took truth and forged it and formed it in such a way that the fullness of, God, of the gospel answers so many questions that the world has had. This is what Chesterton said. I love the quote. In the case of Smith, the name is so poetical that it must be an arduous and heroic matter for the man to live up to it. The name of Smith is the name of the one trade that even kings respected. Even the village children feel that in some dim way the smith is poetic, as the grocer and the cobbler are not poetic, when they feast on the dancing sparks and deafening blows in the cavern of that creative violence. The brute repose of nature, the passionate cunning of man, the strongest of earthly metals, the weirdest of earthly elements, the unconquerable iron subdued by its own conqueror, the wheel and the plowshare, the sword and the steam hammer, the arraign of armies and the whole legend of arms. All these things are written, briefly indeed, but quite legibly, on the visiting card of Mr. Smith. This name made of iron and flame. From the darkest dawn of history, this clan has gone forth to battle. Its trophies are on every hand. Its name is everywhere. It is older than the nations, and its sign is the hammer of Thor. <laughs> Don't you love that? Makes me wish my last name was Smith. Oh, but to become a Smith in my own right, this creative violence to take, to take material and fashion it into something glorious. Joseph did that. So many smiths, whatever their name might have been, have done likewise. And Israel was in danger at this point for, because of its lack of smiths. Okay, can we be more like, like one that God can trust with iron and flame? Well, chapter 14 then. And this is one of my favorite chapters in 1 Samuel. Here you get to meet Jonathan. We saw his name at the end of chapter 13. Uh, he's got a sword in hand one of the few. But here you get to see what's in his heart, and it is glorious. In fact, I love the story of Jonathan so much that I dreamed of having a son I could name Jonathan, and our second child was a boy. And so, as my wife and I talked about it, and I just shared how much I love this story and this figure in the scriptures, we named him Jonathan. The name stuck for two days. And as we were packing things up to leave the hospital, I turned to my wife and I said, Honey, it pains me to even say this, but this isn't Jonathan. I can't. I've been calling this little sweet little baby that name for the last two days. It's not sticking. It's not him. I still don't totally know who he is, but he's not Jonathan. Who, who is he? 
And my wife heaved a sigh of relief and said, oh, I'm so glad you said that because I've been feeling the same thing. I love the name Jonathan. I love the story Jonathan. Maybe we'll have a Jonathan someday, but that this isn't Jonathan. And as we pondered and as we prayed, we knew who this little baby was. And he's our Jacob. And he lives up to the Jacob of the Old Testament. He lives up to the Jacob of the Book of Mormon. He's an incredible, incredible young man. But I remember once uh, in a seminary class talking about Jonathan, and I said to them, I love this figure. I love the name. I had a son named Jonathan for two days. And then I looked at their faces as they just like started to melt and like, in, oh, like <gasps> and I realized the way I said that had sent the wrong message, like my, my baby had died. And I was like, oh, no, 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 he's still alive. It's Jacob now. Okay, we're good. Uh, everything's fine. I just want you to know how much I love the name Jonathan. And so here he is. And what makes me love him so much is, I'll put it this way. Take 1 Samuel 14, and it's Jonathan in battle. Compare it to 1 Samuel 17, and it's David in battle. We'll get there briefly. And that's David and Goliath. That makes us just in awe of who David was. And like, of course he should be the next king. Well, not so fast. If you read 1 Samuel 17 by itself, of course, who's better than David? But read 1 Samuel 14 first, and you're like, well, who's better than David? Jonathan, maybe. It, put these two side by side and no wonder they're best friends. They're cut from the same cloth and the cloth is glorious. So watch this and be perhaps even more impressed with Jonathan here than you will be in, with, in, with David in a moment. In chapter 14, Philistines are still the enemy. They're still oppressing the Israelites. Verse 2, Saul tarried in the uttermost part of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which is in Migron. And the people that were with him were about 600 men. So pretty small force. Maybe that's the reason that Saul is hesitating. But tarrying when you should be going out to battle, well, we'll learn from David next week that that's not a good idea. Okay? If it's time to fight, you got to go fight. If it's time to serve, you got to go serve. Okay? If it's time to lead, go lead. But Saul's not leading. He's tarrying. He's behind. Meanwhile, verse 6, Jonathan, Saul's son, said to the young man that bare his armor, Come, let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. Now, that's the first time you see Jonathan really open his mouth, and it's amazing what comes out of it. He's a solitary soldier, right? One of the few that has a sword, I suppose. And he turns to his armor bearer and says, I don't know what we're standing around doing nothing for. There's Philistines across the way, and they're our enemy, and they're God's enemy, which means God can be, we'll, he is on our side. And if we'll just trust in him, what are we waiting for? Now, he's just talking to his armor bearer. Those, so the two of them. And who does he say we're going to go up against? The garrison of those uncircumcised? David's going to use similar language, the uncircumcised Philistines. Circumcision is the, the sign of the covenant, the token and so by calling someone uncircumcised, they're saying, you're outside the covenant. You don't have the, the God of Israel on your side. So how could you possibly beat us if we're faithful? And Jonathan was faithful. The way he says it, it may be that the Lord will work for us. Oh, if we can just trust that God will be with us, then who cares who's against us? Even if it's a whole garrison of Philistine troops. Sometimes garrison is used to describe a, a certain number. Other times garrison is used to describe like the citadel that they are guarding, however many there are. And we don't know for sure here just how many Philistines are there guarding the garrison. We know there's at least 20 and then some. And so this is a sizable force, especially when it's only two. These are worse than 10 to 1 odds. Okay, But that doesn't phase Jonathan as long as God is with him. God doesn't care about the size of our force. He only cares about the focus of our heart. And if our heart's on him, then we can't lose. So, armor bearer, you with me? You and me? We're going to take on a garrison? Verse 7, the armor bearer says to him, Do all that is in thine heart, turn thee, behold, I am with thee, according to thy heart. So it seems that Jonathan's courage has begotten courage in the heart of his armor bearer. Again, you know what kind of leader you are based on what kind of followers you have and what they're willing to do in following you. And this, is, this speaks highly of the armor bearer as well as very highly of Jonathan. 
And the two men then start sneaking, kind of tiancom like <laughs> across enemy lines towards this Philistine garrison. Then they pop out of hiding. And in verse 11, the Philistines said, Behold, the Hebrews come forth out of the holes where they had hid themselves. They're totally mocking them. It's like, oh, look, it's like we're playing whack-a-mole. You remember earlier, the, the Israelites are so scared, they keep hiding themselves so they don't, don't get discovered and destroyed. Well, oh, you misjudged Jonathan. He's not hiding out of fear. He's trying to get closer. And in fact, he had said to his armor bearer a few verses earlier, let's sneak over there. And then we'll pop out and say, gotcha. And we'll see how they react. And if they do one thing, we'll use that as a sign that God does not want us to attack. But if they do something else, we'll know that God does want us to attack. And that was the symbol, the sign that God was going to be with us. And so they're like, okay, we got them right where we want them. That's what happens in verse 12. The men of the garrison answered Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, come up to us and we will show you a thing. <laughs> Just, there's some, I guess, uh, battlefield smack talk. We'll show you a thing. And Jonathan said unto his armor bearer, come up after me, for the Lord hath delivered them into the hand of Israel. That's the exact response we were asking for. God has shown his hand. He will be with us. So let's go. And then notice this description of the battle. As you hear it, try to put it side by side with what you know about the battle between, or the fight between uh, David and Goliath. And there's some interesting differences. 13 and 14. Jonathan climbed up upon his hands and upon his feet. Can you picture the steepness of the slope? His hands and feet, he's scrambling up this incline. His armor bearer after him. So the guy that's supposed to be protecting him is actually behind him. And they, the enemy, fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer slew after him. And that first slaughter, which Jonathan and his armor bearer made, was about 20 men within, as it were, a half acre of land, which a yoke of oxen might plow. And like I said, that seemed to me even more impressive than the story of David and Goliath. Put them side by side and consider this. David and Goliath, that's one on one. That's it. Compare it to Jonathan and the Philistine garrison, and you've got two against more than 20. David and Goliath, there's one casualty. Jonathan, 20. David and Goliath, it's the Valley of Elah. They're on level ground, whereas Jonathan, is, it's a literal uphill battle. And he scrambles up on all fours and still can defeat the enemy. With David and Goliath, David maintains safe distance. He's slinging stones. Meanwhile, Jonathan, this is hand-to-hand -hand combat. Two on 20 plus within a half acre, this is close quarters. And like I said, his protection is behind him, not in front. I'm blown away by the courage and the faith of Jonathan. And if you were trying to pick a successor, oh, you could keep it in the family and do just fine and let the crown or the anointing of Saul pass to Jonathan, he's the type of person I'd be willing to charge into battle with. Now, verse 15, I'm not the only one who felt that. There was trembling in the host, in the field, among all the people, the garrison and the spoilers. They also trembled and the earth quaked. So it was a very great trembling. There is massive fear among the enemy ranks. And fear among the enemy means faith, or at least some courage, some confidence among his friends. And so the rest of the army begins to attack the Philistines as well. Verse 21, moreover, the Hebrews that were with the Philistines before that time, which went up with them into the camp from the country round about, even they also turned to be with the Israelites that were with Saul and Jonathan. See, what that verse suggests is that some Israelites had abandoned Israel and thought, well, I want to be on the winning team, and Israel is certainly not going to win, so I'll just join the Philistines. And that's sometimes the case. When people look at the church and the world and compare the two and start to worry that I think the world's going to win this battle, and so I'm going to leave the church and join the world. Uh, I can fit in. I'll <laughs> we'll be like all the nations. But when they see strength on the Lord's side, it's amazing to watch their confidence grow and them come back running. That's what happens with these Hebrews. Then there's another group, verse 22. Likewise, all the men of Israel, which had hid themselves in Mount Ephraim, when they heard that the Philistines fled, even they also followed hard after them in the battle. 
So these were the undecided. These, I mean, if the first group were those that had apostatized from Israel or had actually left the church, so to speak, this group is now the inactive. They're the ones that are still on Israel's side but haven't joined the army. And they're just kind of hunkering down and hiding out and don't want to be on either side. They halt between two opinions. And what do they do? When they see what's happening, they come running back to the Lord's side as well. I think there's powerful potential if members of the church showed our strength and showed that the Lord was with us and marched forward and lived the gospel of Jesus Christ with the kind of faith and fortitude that Jonathan displayed. Maybe it only takes two of us to start. Maybe that's enough. And people that are worried, yeah, maybe there's three groups, in fact. Yeah, there's, the, there's Saul's men that are ready to fight, but not quite ready to fight. Yes, we're the army, but I'm scared. And they just need Jonathan's example to encourage them. Then you have the inactive that needed to pop up out of their hiding places and come to the battle. Then you have those that have already changed allegiances, but would be quick to change back as soon as they see that there is faith and, and power and conviction and courage on the side of God. They were on that side at one point. I imagine they wish that they had cause to come back. And even if it's just you, Jonathan, or you, armor bearer, rush forward. And you'll be amazed to see who will end up following, following you and fighting alongside you. Now, the rest of this chapter is an interesting one. Because what ends up happening is it explains that in a, a later battle, Saul had commanded the people to fast. Now, that sounds good. Uh, he's seeking the Lord's help, right? Well, or has he already lost the Lord's help? Uh, Samuel told him it's going to pass to somebody else. Uh, is he just kind of desperate and I'll do anything? Also, is that very wise military strategy? Now, we said before, it wasn't, wiz it wasn't military tactics to just march around Jericho and blow trumpets and yell. It wasn't the wisest military tactic to circumcise the army, first thing you do, when, now that you're in enemy territory. But now those were commands of God, and it was taking the covenant and doing what was right, and they were worthy of God's assistance. Saul, not so much. And so I worry that in this case, this was a desperate act of, please God be with me, and I'm going to do something unwise or overzealous in hopes of convincing you to come back to me. Because I, don't, I wouldn't say that fasting is a very wise thing for an army to do during a battle. Okay, You're going to need your strength. And Jonathan, among others, knows that. Now, what Jonathan doesn't know is that his dad had made this command that everyone's supposed to fast today. It's our only hope. And I'm totally unaware of that. Uh, Jonathan walks by and he sees this honeycomb and thinks, oh, honey, some, something sweet. This is a land flowing with milk and honey, right? Well, there's the honey. And he dips his, his rod in the, in the honeycomb and takes it to his mouth. And it says that his eyes are enlightened. It's like, oh, that's just what I needed, a little sugar rush, okay? And my blood sugar's up, and I'm ready to go continue the battle because I've been kind of worn down in the, the battle and the heat of the day. Now, the people had heard about Saul's command, even though Jonathan hadn't, and they see what Jonathan did, does, and they're kind of freaked out, probably because they know the kind of personality that, that, that uh, Saul has. And so it's like, uh, you did a bad thing, and, and this isn't going to go well. They tell Jonathan about Saul's command, Jonathan is like, what? He said, that's the, I'm sorry, but that's like the dumbest middle, military advice you could, you could have. And so, no, dad's in the wrong. I'm not. You can see in Jonathan, he's willing to stand up to his father. He's willing to be wise and, and lead out. He's willing to push back. In verse 29, he says, my father hath troubled the land. See, I pray you how mine eyes have been enlightened because I tasted a little of this honey. How much more if haply the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies which they found. For had there not been now a much greater slaughter among the Philistines? Man, we could have done so much better in this battle if we'd had energy to fight. And so while we're destroying the Philistines, we could have taken their spoil and eaten what was there and continued the battle. Instead, we're all famished and faint. This was not wise, Dad. But then notice what happens next. This is interesting. On the one hand, they've been fasting all day. 
And now they see that, well, Jonathan broke the fast, again, unknowingly, uh, but he has a point. He's right about that. Here's the problem. We talked about proving contraries earlier, and most people are either speaking the truth or they're speaking in love, but it's hard to find the right balance. Well, here we see pendulum swings. And just like we swung the pendulum historically from we're only going to speak truth and we're going to protest solemnly and we're going to show them the manner and we're going to say that this is how things have to be and there's no tolerance for anyone outside the lines. Well, society has corrected that and unfortunately overcorrected that. And now the rising generation is at a point where it's you should never protest solemnly and you should never show them the manner. You should only hearken to their voice. Okay? So again, historical pendulum swings. And here you see one. Because on the one side, there was this overzealousness, this kind of extremism, unwise on their part. No, you shouldn't call a fast under these circumstances. But then what ends up happening, once they see Jonathan's example and hear his advice, they overcorrect and overswing the pendulum. And having just defeated the Philistine army, verse 32, the people flew upon the spoil and took sheep and oxen and calves and slew them on the ground and the people did eat them with the blood. They didn't even take time to cook this meat, let alone butcher it according to kosher laws which drain the blood since it's completely against kosher law, back in Leviticus, to eat blood with the meat. So we've just gone from overzealousness to complete disregard of the commandments of God. Talk about a pendulum swing. They went from one extreme to its opposite. They went from first being unwise to then being impatient. They went from too intense at the beginning to being di totally disobedient at the end. So what happens next? Saul tries to correct his army's poor behavior. He rallies the troops to go back into battle. And then he asks God for direction, which doesn't come that day. Is he worthy of it? Don't think so. So he assumes, well, it couldn't be me uh, that's keeping God at, at bay. So there's got to be someone guilty in the camp. And so he casts lots and shock to him, it falls on Jonathan. And he's like, Jonathan, it's your fault we've, we've lost, we've been losing? Like, no, in fact, it's my fault we're winning. I was the one with the guts to go take on the garrison. But here's, again, a, an overcorrection, another pendulum swing back in the opposite direction on Saul's part. Because Saul, when he finds out what happens, he ends up deciding to kill Jonathan, his son. Actually, he said that earlier before he knew the guilty party. He says this in verse 39. For as the Lord liveth, which saveth Israel, though it be Jonathan my son, he shall surely die. Now, there was not a man among all the people that answered him. See, this is when Saul is trying to figure out who did this, who's guilty. He hasn't cast the lots quite yet. And he's saying, whoever it is, I don't care. Even if it's Jonathan, my own son, I'll kill him. I'm serious. Now, Jonathan would have been the last person he would have assumed. And the people know it, but they just heard what Saul said, and they know what Jonathan's done, and they're like, I'm not going to say anything. And so they don't answer a word, which is why then Saul goes to the casting lots. And when it falls on Jonathan, like I said, he's shocked, dismayed. What, have you, what, what did you do? And Jonathan's like, what did I do? What did you do? I, it was not wise to fast. And I didn't even know that you'd made the command. So if this is a sin, I sinned in ignorance, Father. And it gave me the strength and power to continue the battle. It would have done the same for our troops. He explains everything. But here's the irony again. And Saul swinging the pendulum back to an over-extreme fanaticism. He says, nope. You caused this problem, and like I said, I'm not going back on my word, I will now slay you. Which shows his rashness rather than his wise judgment. It actually takes the people to rise up against Saul and say, no, 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 do not do this. In verse 45, they say, shall Jonathan die who hath wrought this great salvation in Israel? God forbid. As the Lord liveth, there shall not one hair of his head fall to the ground. For he hath wrought with God this day. So the people rescued Jonathan, but he died not. So throughout chapter 14, Jonathan is looking better and better. Saul, he's looking worse and worse. Now, by the end of chapter 14, Saul has consolidated his power in Israel by defeating enemy after enemy after enemy. He takes down the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Philistines, the Amalekites. 
And then in chapter 15, it shifts with Samuel reminding Saul of what the Amalekites, that latest enemy, has been doing all along. If you remember way back in Exodus chapter, what, 17? That's when they first crossed the, the, uh, the Red Sea. They're, they're fresh out of Egypt, and they're not ready for, to, to take on some other enemy on their way to the Promised Land. The Amalekites know that, and so that's when they ambush Israel. That's the story when, when it takes Moses with the rod in his hand to hold it up the whole time, right? And it was the Amalekites that were the enemy. They have been a horrible enemy to Israel ever since. And that's when Samuel comes aboard and reminds Saul of all this that the, the Amalekites have done. In verse 2, he says, how they laid wait for him in the way. That was that earlier battle in Exodus 17. Totally unprovoked. They just jumped out and took on Israel unprepared. In a way, you could say that was attacking God's little ones. And to borrow the Lord's phrase in the New Testament, better that a millstone be hung around their neck and cast into the depths of the sea than to attack someone so ill-prepared to defend themselves. Well, as a result, there is uh, the mark of death upon the Amalekites. And in verse 6, Saul says to the Kenites, and those are Midianites that are related to Jethro, they're dwelling among the Amalekites. And Saul says to them, Go, depart, get you down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For ye showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. You see there, Saul is showing mercy to the innocents. He's trying to be careful. We saw this back in Judges uh, as well, just trying to distinguish between people that justice demanded their destruction those who had committed capital crimes and deserved capital punishment, from those that just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and had mingled or mixed among them, and you're not guilty. So we're going to distinguish between Amalekites and Midianites, even though they're living among each other, and Midianites, you're free to go because we don't want you to suffer collateral damage. There's, there's some care and caution here, and it's important to realize that as we wrestle with the difficulty of the conquest of Canaan, for example. Well, with the Kenites safely removed, Saul and his army then fall upon this particular Amalekite city and completely destroy it. Verse 9, but Saul and the people spared Agag. He was the king of that city. And they spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. Are we still swinging this pendulum? We went from the extremism of, hey, we should fast during the battle to the opposite extreme of, well, eat up and let's even eat the blood with the food and not, we're not even going to wait to bless it, okay? Uh, and then it swings back to, no, we've got to be strict and careful and we're gonna, I'm going to kill anybody that, that didn't do my, my will, even if it's my own son. Well, here has Saul overcorrected yet again to say, well, maybe obedience can be selective after all. And even though we were commanded by God to destroy everything, among the Amalekites. Complete annihilation. Uh, do we have to? In verse 10, Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king. Now look for the JST. God doesn't have to repent. It says simply, I have set up Saul to be a king, and he repenteth not that he hath sinned. For he is turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments, and it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. Now that tells you something about God. I, well, people need to follow my commandments. Don't avoid either extreme, okay? The overzealousness or the underzealousness. Let's just be zealous. Let's just be obedient. Let's be balanced. Let's stay in the Goldilocks zone, shall we? But it also says something about Samuel there. It grieved him. He cried unto the Lord all night. This would be me saying, I told you so, uh, to the people. But no, it, it lets you know that Samuel was less concerned about being right, even though he was right, and just more interested in the, in the benefit, in, in the safety and the goodness, the prosperity of his people. And he realizes, no, Saul is it's fallen apart right before my eyes, just like I knew that it would. I didn't want to be right 
I let them know the manner of the king that they would have, and we're getting just that kind of king. It'll get worse before it ever gets better. I wish I weren't right, because the people are going to learn a hard lesson because of their mistakes. And I wish I could help them avoid that. That's all I've ever wanted to do. Verse 13 then, Samuel came to Saul, And Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Saul seems a little clueless now and then. Before it was, hey, so good to see you, Samuel. Um, We just missed you. Actually, you just missed the sacrifice. But I've seen you do it enough. I did a great job. Uh, That's not what you were supposed to do. In this one, it's, Uh, Good to see you, Samuel. I did just what the Lord said. I destroyed this Amalekite city. Did you? Did you do it the way the Lord commanded? In verse 14, Samuel says, Well, then what meaneth then this bleating of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? That doesn't sound like complete annihilation of all the inhabitants and all the flocks and herds, the possessions of the Amalekites. What, What? Are my ears playing tricks on me? So Saul says, well, well, they have brought them from the Amalekites. For the, the, the people, they spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen. Why? Well, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. Who's guilty here? I mean, this was the problem in the earlier chapter. It's the same thing's happening. Saul hasn't learned. Well, the people made me do it. And, the, and you made me do it because you were late. And the Philistines made me do it because they were chomping at the bit to fight us. In this case, as well, the, the people. <sighs> you know the people. They're so hard to please. And they demanded this. But what was the demand for? It was for your God. I mean, and I'm with you on that. He deserves our best. It deserves the Amalekite best. And so we spared these animals, to offer sacrifice. Yeah, that wasn't for us. These are not spoils of war. No, these are sacrifices waiting to be offered. And and I wouldn't want to offer them without you present, Samuel, so so glad you're here. Well, Samuel's not fooled. He responds in verse 17, Saul, when thou wast little in thine own sight, yes, despite being head and shoulders above anyone else in Israel, Wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? I mean, it sounds like Samuel's been listening to his mother's song. Remember the song of Hannah was all about lowering the lofty, but, but lifting the lowly. And when Saul felt lowly, that's when God lifted him. Such a great phrase, when you were little in thine own sight. There's a part of me that still wishes you were tempted to hide behind your stuff. Because instead, you're, looks, it looks like you're looking for stuff to, to build yourself up. That's a problem. You were told to destroy everything the Amalekites possessed. 19, wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord? But didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord catch all the corrections that Samuel just made to Saul, thou should have obeyed. Don't blame the people. This was spoil, not sacrifice. And you did evil. You didn't intend to do good. Samuel sees through all of that. Now Saul protests. You probably figured he would. In verse 20, he says, no, 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 you. Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and have gone the way which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people, they took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed. But again, for good reason, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. He just can't humble himself. He just can't get little in his own sight again to admit that he was at least partially to blame. He's still making excuses. He's still distancing himself from responsibility. So, verse 22, Samuel responds, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Then a super famous verse, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. Now, that's a fascinating passage. To obey is better than to sacrifice? Wait, really? Wouldn't it seem like sacrifice 
No, sacrifice is going above and beyond obedience, so it's got to be better. Well, I see where you're coming from, and that might be true, but then it, you can't leapfrog. The, in fact, the only way to get to real sacrifice is by passing through obedience along the way. My first mission president taught me that. And I still remember this interview I had with him as a young missionary and super intimidated by my, my big barrel-chested Texan uh, of a mission president. As he just sat me down and said, Elder Halverson, in his great Texan drawl, I'm proud of you for being obedient. And he just kind of, he drew this kind of scale and said, or this spectrum, and said, once you have fully learned to obey the commandments of God, you are then ready in some, in some ways, that's the only way you can pass beyond obedience into the realm of sacrifice. Sacrifice is preceded by obedience. Obedience is what prepares you for sacrifice. It's what sanctifies the sacrifice that you make because your heart's in the right place. You've proven that. There's something... Again, that's, that's, a, that's a, almost a 30-year-old memory. But it's stuck because there's truth there. There's value there. And I think Samuel is trying to teach Saul that exact principle. Oh, sacrifice. You're not even in a place where you're able or worthy to offer real, meaningful sacrifice. Because you never... I mean, what's the point of sacrifice anyway? All these oxen and sheep? No, that was never the point. It's the broken heart and the contrite spirit. It's the animal within you. And what breaks the heart and makes the spirit contrite... It's learning to, to fully give your heart to God, to submit your will to His, and that's what we call obedience. Even in sacred places, to think about a covenant of obedience that prepares us for a covenant of sacrifice. And to obey is better than sacrifice. It's got to go in that order. By the way, there's a little funnier take on this. Boyd, uh, Boyd K. Packer was once junior companion to Spencer W. Kimball at a meeting, and the previous speakers had gone too long, and so there wasn't much time left. And there were still two speakers on the docket, a junior apostle, Boyd K. Packer, and his senior companion, President Kimball. And so President Kimball whispered, leaned over, because he knew that President Packer, or Elder Packer was going up next, and he said to him, take all, take all the time. I'll just bear a brief testimony, uh, final word. So you just take all, the, I don't want you to shorten your talk. I'll shorten mine. And Elder Packer got up and gave the briefest of testimonies, knowing that the people would prefer to hear from President Kimball than from him. So super brief testimony, sat back down. Uh, and President pa uh, Kimball scribbled something really quick and handed it over to Elder Packer as he took the stand. And as Elder Packer, thinking he had done Elder President Kimball a favor by giving him all the time to speak, he unfolded the paper and it simply said, to obey is better than to sacrifice. <laughs> ah, a little sheepish. Sorry about that, President Kimball. Uh, so often it's well-meaning and we're trying, and that's good, and I think God honors that. But at the end of the day, I would have loved if you had simply done what I asked. Obedience is a powerful thing. Sacrifice cannot replace it. In verse 23, Samuel goes on, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Now, interesting comparisons there. Rebellion equals witchcraft? Huh? Stubbornness is like idolatry? Now, everybody knew that witchcraft and idolatry were big no-no's. But to put rebellion and stubbornness on that level, aren't you being a little extreme? Well, let's put it in these terms. Witchcraft and rebellion are both denials of the true God. You're going elsewhere. But in a way, aren't rebellion and stubbornness similar? I mean, you're not denying the existence of God, but you are denying his, his authority over you. Being stubborn, I don't want to follow you. Rebelling? I just want to do my own thing. Well, this consequence, the last thing that Samuel had said, you rejected God, God will reject you, that woke up Saul to make a full confession. He says in 24 and 5, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, 
because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now, therefore, I pray thee, pardon my sin and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. Much better pronouns there. I and me and my, and I'm sorry for what I did. We need to own those things if we ever hope to be able to pass them back to Jesus for him to take upon himself and atone. If we never claim them to be ours, we don't have anything to give to him by way of broken heart and contrite spirit. But I do worry a little about what's motivating that final statement. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, okay? It was me, it was me. But will you just turn with me and, and sacrifice with me so we can worship together before the people? Now, what's motivating that? Keep reading. Verse 26, Samuel says to Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. It's too late. Now, Samuel turned about to go away, and as he did so, Saul laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle, and it rent. He tore it. He was like, no, no, you can't leave. You can't leave. And he grabs him, and as he walks away, the, his, his shawl, his mantle, his cloak rips. And Samuel said unto him, oh, well, thank you for the visual aid. The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. I'm sorry, Saul, that your sorrow was too little too late. And in fact, was it prideful? Was it self-serving? This doesn't seem like godly sorrow. It seems a little bit more like the sorrow of the damned that Mormon talks about. Especially, Saul, since you were king. And where much is given, much is required. I mean, if Moses doesn't even get into the promised land, then no, you're not going to get a second chance here, or yet another, I don't even know what number we're on, to lead the house of Israel. But desperate, Saul responds in verse 30, I have sinned. Okay, isn't that enough? Isn't that confession? Yet honor me now, I pray thee, before the elders of my people, and before Israel, and turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord thy God. It's like, have you ever seen this when something bad is happening in public and the people that are in this altercation are like, can we not do this right here? Not right now, not in front of everyone. And I get that sense from Saul where it's like, okay, I'm wrong and you're right. But can we just go through the motions and offer our sacrifices and pretend all is well? We, you and I can deal with this behind closed doors. But here before the elders of my people, before the house of Israel, will you please honor me? and at least put on a public face that I'm still the king of Israel. Well, torn cloak and all, Samuel decides, okay, I'll do that for now. Verse 31, so Samuel turned again after Saul, and Saul worshiped the Lord. Good enough? Well, Samuel's pretty ticked off that he even had to do that, that kind of public display uh, that was undeserved. And so in 32 and 3, this is where the chapter ends, and it's pretty brutal, so buckle up. Then said Samuel, bring ye hither to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. Now, Agag knows what's coming. So he came unto him delicately, and Agag said, surely the bitterness of death is past. Like, well, no, no hard feelings, right? Uh, I mean, the, the heat of battle is behind us, and... Uh, you destroyed my, my city, and you, you have all the spoils, and um, surely we can let bygones be bygones after that, right? No. Uh, it was not for good reason that you were spared by Saul, and so you certainly won't be spared by me, Samuel. Samuel says to him, As thy sword hath made women childless, so shall thy mother be childless among women. And Samuel hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Now, that's brutal. Uh, that's one you'd second-guess Samuel, perhaps. And yet, like we've said so many times, if this is capital crime deserving capital punishment, and in fact, he's the leader of it, and where much was, and, and he that sins against the greater light receives the greater condemnation, well, that's happening here. And the way Samuel even said it, you showed no mercy to others, and so no mercy will be shown to you. I'm not saying we should live this way. We live at a higher time. That's why Jesus says, the law says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I don't say that anymore. The law says, hate your enemy. And, and that's some righteous indignation that is moving Samuel there. 
Jesus raises the bar and says, pray for those that despitefully use you and persecute you. But we're still a thousand years from that. Okay, there's a lot of growing up in God that they still need to do. In this t time, in this place, Samuel is being swift and stern and absolutely just. In fact, there's even that enforced empathy that we talked about in the book of Exodus. You're, you made people know what it feels like to be childless. Well, your mom's going to feel the same thing. And thus the execution. Samuel and Saul then go their separate ways. And in verse 35, Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul. And the Lord repented that he had made Saul king over Israel. And again, there's a JST that lets you know, no, the, the repentance is not on God's part. You see what that last verse lets us know about? Samuel had to turn away. I've tried to help you, uh, Saul, all every step of the way, and it hasn't worked. And I, as just as I am, there is still mercy shining through my sorrow. Because I'm not saying I told you so to Israel. And I'm not saying I told you so to you. I mourn for you. It's, it's the old saying of this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. I don't know if that's often true when we're punishing children, for example. But it was true for Samuel in this moment. He mourned for Saul. I, this is love shining through the enforcement of law. This is sorrow the, for the fact that he has to administer justice. There's a balancing act that Samuel has grown very good at. But then we turn to chapter 16. And here we finally get to meet the boy, David. We met a young Samuel that grew up in God. We met a younger Saul that wasn't so full of himself. But unfortunately, his ego has grown to fill his gigantic frame. And so God has now turned to yet another stripling. A youth that he knows has incredible potential to grow up in God. Chapter 16, verse 1, the Lord says to Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil. Go, I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. Again, you get a glimpse of Samuel's celestial soul there. How long are you going to mourn for Saul? Again, no neener neener. I'm just sad. I wanted the best thing for Israel. That's why I told them not to have a king. And when they wouldn't budge, and I hearkened to their voice, I gave them the best king we could find. And, well, you did. And I joined him and followed and tried to build him up and magnify him in the sight of the people and tried to guide his path. I prayed that the Spirit would descend upon him. I saw him prophesy among the prophets. It, why didn't it work? There's incredible goodness in Samuel there. I wanted to be wrong. But the Lord is saying, it's time to move forward. Okay? Just like you were saying to Israelites, don't live in your past. You can't live in your past either. It's time to move forward. So verse 2, Samuel says, well, how can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. Which shows just how far Saul has fallen. Talk about rashness replacing sound judgment. Uh, talk about... Pride and vindictiveness and anger, unrestrained, becoming so well known that Samuel fears for his own life. Well, Samuel decides to go to Bethlehem under pretense of offering some kind of sacrifice there. Okay, I'm just doing my duties. I'm not, I'm not anointing your successor. That, that, no, of course not. Of course not. Well, verse 4, the elders of the town trembled at his coming where he got, when he got to Bethlehem and said, Comest thou peaceably? Now, they perhaps heard of what happened at the end of chapter 15. Samuel did what? He, he, did, he executed King Agag. Whoa, okay. He's serious about keeping the commandments. Mm-hmm, you think? Now, their response, though, is interesting. Do we tremble when prophets come to speak? Are we scared of a general conference? Because if we are, it suggests we're not very well prepared for it. Remember what Nephi said to Laman and Lemuel. The, the, if the truth hurts, it's supposed to. Okay? It only hurts the wicked because it cuts them to the very center. It actually justifies the righteous because it's like, oh, I'm, I, I'm actually doing all right. Well, these people are trembling at the coming of Samuel. And their question was, well, are, are you coming peaceably? 
If you're prepared, then the words of God are peaceable. They're confirmatory. They're, they're beautiful. But these folks, they are worried about Samuel. I guess he's famous for his hard sayings. Who can hear them? Well, he comes. He sees these sons of Jesse, and he assumes that the, first one, the firstborn must be the one that God intends to make king. But verse 7, the Lord says to him, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature. Remember two of the big things we learned about Saul early on? He was goodlier than anyone. There's the beauty of his countenance. And what was the other one? Head and shoulders above the rest? Well, there's the height of his stature. It's like, Samuel, Samuel, learn. Okay, It's not outward appearance that we're after here. He says, I have refused him, as good as he looks from the outside. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. That is a beautifully famous verse, and I'm grateful that it is. I hope we can internalize it more than just memorize it. That we can think a little less about outward appearance. That we can look a little deeper. I've talked before about the degrees of glory, and if the telestial glory is just stuff you have, including good looks, then terrestrial is a little better. That's what you can do, accomplishments. But celestial glory, that's who you are. And are you new, newly made with a transformed heart? Are you like the Savior? That's who the Lord is looking for, someone after his own heart. So Jesse brings all seven of his sons by. And no, 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 uh, ooh, no, uh, nah, okay, huh, uh, huh. That's everybody? Are you sure that's every single one? Verse 11, Samuel says to Jesse, Are here all thy children? So even Jesse didn't think to bring David. And Jesse says, Well, there does remain yet the youngest. Behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Well, send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. Talk about being intent on accomplishing his mission. Sounds like Abraham's servant, right? When he was looking for Rebekah. Like, tell me now and let's get on with this. Okay, if not, I've got more work to do. And Samuel's feeling the same kind of pressure. But I do like what he's saying to dad there. Why don't you bring him? Don't automatically disqualify anyone from consideration just because you are assuming things about them. Like they're too young or too little or, or unqualified or not this enough or not that enough. I worry sometimes we do that when we're thinking of people who might be able to serve in a calling or function in a certain role or take on a certain mission and we just we don't even call David because there's no way it could be him it might very well be exactly him so don't cross anybody off the list without real thinking and pondering praying because you might be surprised who the Lord has in mind that was definitely the case here and best of all what's David doing oh he's just out with the sheep Oh, you mean you have a shepherd in this boy? Oh, he sounds like a good shepherd. Huh. That might be somebody that the Lord would have his eye on. <laughs> Definitely. Verse 12, he sent and brought him in. Now he, David, was ruddy. So kind of flushed red in the cheeks. That, that's usually a sign of, of absolute youthfulness. He was ruddy. With all of a beautiful countenance, goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Now, there I picture Samuel kind of looking confused, like, wait a minute, I thought you said that outward appearance doesn't matter, that I'm not supposed to look on his outward uh, countenance, it's just his heart. This kid is good looking. I mean, yeah, he's young, kind of flushed in the cheeks, but beautiful countenance, goodly to look to. So, well, I'm confused. And I picture the Lord saying, well, come on, Samuel, I, it's not that outward appearance is an automatic qualifier. That was what I said back in, in verse 7. But it, neither is it an automatic disqualifier. It's kind of beside the point. Uh, maybe it's a bonus blessing for some, but it's don't automatically disqualify them because they don't have it, but don't automatically disqualify them because they do. Look deeper, okay? And, and I guess to me there's something powerful there of where our priorities are. And what are we looking for in a person? It better be the deep things. It better be the important things. Other things might be there, they might not. Are you okay with that? Uh, but you might be surprised 
that God will bless you even above and beyond what you had expected. I felt that when I met my wife. Honestly, when I got home from my mission and decided I just want to spend the rest of my life teaching the gospel, I thought, okay, I need a wife that is ready to move wherever the Lord sends us and just, I don't know, live on a very basic income and, and just prioritize building the kingdom of God. That's what I want. And unfortunately, shame on me, I just assumed those people have deep character. So they probably, I don't know, don't have a lot on the outside because they put all their priorities on the inside. I kind of felt that about myself. I got not, nothing much to look at, but it's like, oh, my heart's in the right place. Okay? And I, I hope my wife, whoever she is, will look past my lack of outward countenance and look at my heart. It's, it's there where it should be, I think. I want it to be. When I met my, who is, when I met Emily, now my wife, I was shocked that her outside was as incredible as her inside. And I, again, shallow me, I thought those were kind of mutually exclusive. Uh, but she was every bit as, as of beautiful countenance and goodly to look to as she was a heart like the Lord's. It was her heart that attracted me to her. And to me, her outward beauty was such an unexpected gift. As if the Lord were saying to me, you didn't expect that. You weren't asking for that. That wasn't your top priority. So I guess I can afford to give it to you. Thanks for not being shallow. I can afford to give you this extra gift. I don't know. There's, to me, something powerful about placing our priorities on what matters most. And, and then let, letting God give us according to his, whatever he considers best. Now, verse 13, Samuel takes the horn of oil. He anoints him in the midst of his brethren, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah, but the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord. Uh-oh, wait, that should alert you. Is there a JST waiting in the wings? Yes. An evil spirit, which was not from the Lord, troubled him. You see what makes all the difference there between David and Saul? It's the spirit. Uh, the anointing oil, that's a good symbol of the Holy Ghost is upon you. This, this gift that brings light and life and nourishing and healing. Oh, there's the gifts of God. There's the grace of God. There's the Spirit of God. And it's now on David, not on Saul. And there is a marked shift here. Especially any time from this point forward where we see Saul. He is definitely devoid of the Spirit of God. It's passed. The mantle, in some ways, has been passed. The anointing. But now that the Spirit of God isn't softening the spirit of Saul, he's kind of in a rough place. And remember, anger was one of his defining emotions. And as long as it was turned to a good purpose, then righteous indignation could propel him to accomplish God's work. Well, now it's not, being, it's not God's work he wants to accomplish. It's his own self-serving desires, and his own emotions are now pushing in that direction. And so Saul is a mess. He's a rough one to live with, angry, bitter, jealous. And so what do the people decide? The servants suggest that, you know, uh, music has a great way of soothing the soul. And so maybe if we can find someone that could, could play music to him, it would, it would soften him. It would, it would soothe him. So verse 18, they're, as they're searching for somebody, one of the servants says, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning, or we could say skilled, talented, in playing, and a mighty valiant man, and a man of war, and prudent in matters, and a comely person, and the Lord is with him. Now, David seems to have everything going for him. Now, the last one's the most important of all. The Lord is with him. The others, I wonder if this was kind of a composite, like, wait, which son of Jesse are you talking about? Man of war? Now, this kid's like child number eight, and he's, he's little, okay? He hangs out with his sheep. But yeah, he's good with the harp. And so bring him in, and, and perhaps whatever spirit and gift he has can be conveyed to Saul, not knowing that the gifts given to Saul had just been passed to David. Some interesting poetic ironies here. Verse 21 and 23 then, David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him 
greatly. Saul loved David greatly. That's important to remember when we see Saul's subsequent actions towards him. And he, David, became Saul's armor bearer. And it came to pass when the evil spirit, again, JST, which was not from God, was upon Saul, that David took a harp, played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. This is where we see David as a psalmist. We don't know if David wrote all the psalms in the book of Psalms, but evidently he wrote some. We see the power of music. The, the Lord rejoices in the song of the heart, and even people that are angry or violent or struggling or depressed or whatever it might be, there is power in music to lift the soul, to help heal the wounded heart. And no wonder David is so gifted in that area. In fact, maybe it's reversed. Maybe it's no wonder he's so close to God because music is something that is a means of expressing that faith and that, that closeness. As I've sometimes talked to people that are struggling with faith or with mental illness and just talked about, I've used this analogy before with you, the gear shift, that if you take all these gears on a mountain bike, for example, you start on the easiest one and slowly build some momentum and then you shift up to, have, to get some speed. And so I've said to people, what's your lowest spiritual gear? What's the one that you barely have to exert any energy at all, but you start to see or feel some, some movement in the soul? For many, it's nature. For some, it's music. And wherever they are, music is often one of those gears that can start so low. Just hit play. Just listen to something. But it also it can act as one of the higher gears also because it can bring so much spiritual momentum and movement. There's something powerful there. I've talked about that with my son during his challenging times, that if you can just hit play on a, a song of the, of the righteous and the song of the heart, a hymn that points you to, to heaven, that, that's a good place to begin. And he has come to agree with that. Well, now we know David, and I just want to know him even better. And no better place to do it than in the Valley of Elah with a giant ahead of him. 1 Samuel 17, an incredibly famous chapter. I, I want to set this one up, not with music, but with art. I had a student years and years ago when I first taught seminary. It was the first time I ever taught the Old Testament. So the first chance I got to teach the story of David and Goliath in a church setting. And I love this story. 1 Samuel 17 is so rich in detail that goes beyond the veggie tale. Okay? Goes beyond the simplistic depictions of a boy with a sling and a and a giant with a sword, and that's kind of all you see. So we got into the details here. And little did I know that I had an artist extraordinaire in that class that was envisioning every detail that we discussed. Later, when he'd graduated and was in college, we became close friends through sem those seminary years, and we still keep in touch. He's a great, great soul, uh, incredibly gifted artistically. And he said that in college, he was in an art class, and the assignment was to paint a page, to take something from literature and depict it in art. So that was going to be the challenge of reading closely enough and critically enough to really paint the picture, <laughs> literally, of what an author was describing uh, in literature. Well, he decided to, to paint 1 Samuel 17. And he gave me a copy of this masterpiece. It was amazing. It's still the most detailed David and Goliath picture I've ever seen. He even included so many details that were so shocking. At one point, he includes a third figure, and he even writes very faintly across the chest, who's this? <laughs> Basically calling out what everybody's wondering. Like, wait, I thought this was David and Goliath. Who's the third guy in between them? Well, we'll see that. Uh, there were so many added extras, but they all find their source on this scriptural page. And when he gave me a copy of that painting, he also gave me a note to explain it. And this is part of what he said. I remember as a little punk sophomore walking mindlessly into my second semester Old Testament seminary class and being greeted with a handshake by a happy-go-lucky seminary teacher that liked to talk about his wife a lot. Well, go figure. Guilty as charged. As he proceeded to teach the class, the story of David and Goliath, which I had been told since the days of flannel board figures in Sunbeam class, 
I began to wonder why I even went to seminary. Furthermore, I felt the previous semester had taught me nothing and that the seminary stuff was a waste of my time when I could be so much more productive at the skate park. And I'd have actually seen him skate at the skate park and he's amazing at it. <laughs> I had heard this stuff over and over and over again. But then, for the first time, I started to listen, truly listen, to the words on the pages and the words speaking to my heart. I began to realize that this story I had been subject to since my childhood was so much more than had been recited in the past. I began to see the scriptures as not just a hard-to-understand historical bore, but rather something very significant and wonderful that appealed to me on a personal level. Because of what this story means to me, I wanted to show throughout the painting my interpretation of its symbolic meaning and any personal insight that I felt while reading it. The outcome of this painting is the outcome you've shown me how to get on every page of scripture I finish reading. That was incredibly kind of him to say. Had it not been for this, the illustration would merely be some big guy, a small guy, and a rock. You've shown me how to see and hear the scriptures with my heart, and words cannot express the thanks I have for the light you have turned on. Now, I just happened to be the one with my hand on the light switch at the time. And what an honor it was for me to see this young man truly just blossom when it came to his, his love of scripture, his testimony of truth. He has done incredible things artistically and professionally and just a, a sweet friend and a celestial soul. And so I treasure this note as well as the painting that accompanied it. And what did he depict? Well, let's jump to the page. Verse 3, the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side. Israel stood on a mountain on the other side. There was a valley between them. Yeah, that's how valleys work. But remember when we were talking about the pep rally at Ebal and Gerizim? And there's the law at the base and blessings shouted from one side and curses shouted from the other. This is the valley of decision, to borrow Joel's phrase. Or Abraham setting up an altar with Bethel on one side and I on the other. House of God versus ruined world. Which mountain will I climb? Well, here from the very beginning of this story, this chapter, you have a choice before you. Do you lean in the Israelite direction or are you pandering to the Philistines? Which one is calling you? We saw that before with, oh, but the Philistines are stronger. We don't even have any smiths on our side. We have to go back down to the Philistines to even sharpen our, our farming implements. And so some do just join the Philistines. Some simply hide from them, but end up hiding from their potential in Israel too. Others are in Israel, but they're, they're not actually fighting, though they're supposed to be. You kind of start seeing all of that displayed across this spectrum in the Valley of Elah. Then verse 4 through 7, here's our depiction of the giant. There went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. That's nine and a half feet tall. He had an helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. According to some estimates, that's near 125 pounds, just the chain mail. He had greaves of brass upon his legs, there's some leg protection, a target of brass between his shoulders. The staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, think very heavy, think very large, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, which is around 16 pounds by most estimates. And here's the detail of who's this third guy in the scene? And one bearing a shield went before him. Now the picture our author is painting for us is that of an insurmountable foe, an opponent that no one's going to be able to, to beat. There's no way around him, certainly no way over him. Um, nobody's getting through him or past him. No wonder the Israelites don't want to fight. I mean, I looked up body armor for the modern military, and some accounts say it's about 40 pounds. And then you add weapons and ammunition and gear, and you could be marching around with 100 pounds. And yet the Philistine would say, oh, no big deal. That's just a start. My chain mail weighs more than that. Add to that the plates between my shoulders, the helmet on my head, uh, the, 
the greaves upon my legs, that's nothing. Oh, and my spear, <laughs> weaver's beam. You probably can't even wrap your hand around it, let alone throw the thing. Because it has a 16 pound, give or take, head point on it. I actually, I mean, that's, that's more than uh, the, uh, any bowling ball, ball I would ever just roll down the lane, uh, let alone try to throw it at somebody. I actually looked up the weight of an Olympic shot put, and it's uh, amazingly about the same, 16 pounds. And the world record for that is 76 feet, which is amazing. But to put that on the end of a weaver's beam and then try to throw it at a moving target, uh, good luck, okay? Nobody's going to beat the Philistine. But did you notice the tactical error among all these advantages? He had someone bearing a shield that went before him. Maybe he wanted both hands free for hand-to-hand -hand combat. Maybe he used two hands to thrust or throw the spear. I don't know, but talk about a mistake. Let Trust someone else with your protection. We talk about the shield of faith in the armor of God. You better be holding your own. Because if you're trying to hide behind somebody else's faith, that might be sufficient for a time, but not in the heat of battle. Well, keep reading. Goliath calls out the armies of Israel every day. He asks them, send me a, somebody to fight with, and it's going to be a winner-take-all fight to the death. If I win, Philistines beat the Israelites, and like, like I'm not going to win. Israelites, you beat me, then you take all. But nobody wants to volunteer for that post. Now, verse 11, when Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed. Yeah, you think? They were greatly afraid, and for good reason. Now, all Israel was probably justifiably afraid, because, wait, our whole, the outcome is going to rest on somebody else? I don't know if I want to have the whole team based on one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, maybe, nobody can beat Goliath in one-on-one, -on -one, but maybe, maybe there's enough of us to defeat all of them? But know who else is dismayed and greatly afraid is Saul. And he ought to be. Because if you looked across the army of the Philistines and you see one giant head and shoulders above the rest, we'll turn around and do the same with Israel. And who are you going to find? A giant in Israel. One who repeatedly has been described as head and shoulders taller than anyone else in Israel. That's Saul. Who should have fought Goliath? The giant of Israel. But he's quaking in his boots. Now verse 12 says that Jesse had eight sons. In the book of First Chronicles, it says he had seven. So there's some discrepancy there. We don't totally know. Either way, he's the youngest. Okay? And in verse 13 and 14, the story says that the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the battle. The names of the three sons that went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and the next unto him, Abinadab, and the third, Shammah. And David was the youngest. And in case you forgot, the three eldest followed Saul. Now, where does that put son four, five, six, maybe seven, however many sons there are? There's at least three boys between these eldest three and David. And I don't know if it's age-based or if it's different responsibilities or they just didn't make muster or whatever. But if it is age-based and only the oldest three are old enough to go out to battle, that means number four can't quite make the ranks and number five is too young, which means number six is definitely off limits, which means David, number seven. I think too often we overestimate his age thinking that, oh yeah, he's got this, he can handle this. Mighty man of, of war, wasn't that what, how he was introduced earlier? It's like, no, you must have got that wrong. That must have been some kind of conflation of information. Uh, I, it's kind of like stripling warriors. When you see a, a very young Captain Moroni and Helaman that still are so distant in age from them that they can call them my sons or my little sons. These are, I've sometimes joked, like, is this the deacon's quorum? like rushing off to battle? Uh, has, has David even graduated from primary yet? I don't know. Okay, I don't know his age. But again, the last of the sons, when only the oldest three are at war, keep that in mind. Verse 16, Goliath keeps taunting 
the people of Israel. He does it for 40 days. That number should ring some bells in terms of the flood, in terms of the wandering in the wilderness, in terms of Moses fasting on Sinai. 40 becomes a great symbol of purification, of preparation, of cleansing. And you wonder, is, is Israel having this time of this gut check, cleansing my heart? Am I prepared? Am I worthy? Can I do this? Can anyone? Well, no one feels like the 40 days have been sufficient to purify them or to prepare them. And so it just keeps going on and on. Meanwhile, Jesse is concerned about his boys. And so he takes his youngest, I guess the one he can spare, and gives him some cheese and some bread and says, go visit your big brothers in the battlefield and see how things are going for them. So verse 20, David rose up early in the morning. He doesn't wait to accomplish his father's will. He left the sheep with a keeper and went to the battlefield to find his brothers. Left the sheep with a keeper? Oh, I said he was a good shepherd. He's maybe even better than I thought. In the parable of the lost sheep, we just talk about leaving the 99 to go after the one. That's good for the one, but what does that, where does that leave the 99? Well, I think the detail that's missing from the parable that David would have supplied is, it's okay, no, no good shepherd is going to leave the 99 shepherdless. They'll definitely be under shepherds. There'll be someone else that's taking care of them because otherwise, what's going to happen? He's going to come back with one and find 99 now lost. No, a good shepherd is better than that. And so David makes sure that all of the sheep are are taken care of, even in his own absence. David gets to the battlefield to visit his brothers just in time to hear one more round of taunting from the, the Philistine giant. But when he hears it, instead of quaking in his boots, he's looking around confused like, are, how, who's, why are we letting this guy get away with this? How come nobody's taking him on? Uh, is this the first time he's done this? I mean, it must be or otherwise somebody would have defeated him long ago. There's the confidence on David's part. In verse 26, he looks around, asks the men, what shall be done to the man that killeth the Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? He's talking smack. He's mocking us. And then he asks, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Did you catch the repetition of what we saw from Jonathan's experience back in chapter 14? He had said... Who's going to take on these uncircumcised Philistines in the garrison? And here David's doing the same thing. For both parties, it's a religious issue. This is covenant against non-covenant. This is not Israel against the Philistines. This is the God of Israel against the God of the Philistines. And we saw that last week, this stump of Dagon with no head and no hands, bowing before the Ark of the Covenant. Come on, let's do this thing. He was ready to defend the honor of Israel and Israel's God. Verse 28, David's oldest brother overhears this. Comes to David, chastens him. That's what, that's what big brothers are for, right? He says, Why camest thou down hither? With whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? So this was not 99 and 1. This was some negligible flock, but one that David still thought was worth defending. His big brother goes on, I know thy pride, the naughtiness of thine heart. For thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. That's it. Now I wonder if Eliab, this oldest son, is just bitter. It said earlier that when, when Samuel anointed David to be the next king, he did it in the presence of his brethren. And wait a minute, if it was supposed to be a son of Jesse, and even Samuel assumed it would be the firstborn Eliab, then you better believe that Eliab would have assumed the same. And I wonder if there's some... Envy, some bitterness on Eliab's part, like it should have been me. I'm out here ready to take on the enemy. I'm ready to lead Israel. Well, are you? You've been here for 40 days doing nothing. But he's angry and he assumes, I mean, if there's pride he's feeling, no wonder it's pride he's assuming or assigning to his little brother. You just came to watch. Well, again, there's an irony. Isn't that all you're doing, big brother? <laughs> you're just sitting around watching no battles take place. No, he's wrong in accusing uh, his brother of any of these things. And David knows it, so he responds in 29. What have I now done? Is there not a cause? I love that he says that. We've got a reason to be courageous. We've got a reason to fight. There is a cause here, and it is the cause of Israel. So gather your courage, and let's start running. 
forward and on, on to the victory. Sound like another leader of Israel we know? That was Joseph Smith's words back in DNC 128. Shall we not go forward in such a cause? That was Captain Moroni's words in the war chapters. This is the cause of Christians. And he's emblazoning that cause upon the title of liberty. It's let the cause inspire you and it will inspire courage within you. If you're struggling, if you're hesitant, if you're feeling inadequate, then internalize the cause of Christ. And you will roar back to David's question. Is there not a cause? Oh, you better believe there is. And it's one worth fighting for. David knows it. Now Saul overhears this. And he's shocked. Who, who's saying this? Who actually has the guts to go face the giant? And somebody taller than me? And instead of looking up to someone, he looks way down at someone that is incredibly small compared to what Saul is. In fact, Saul tries to dissuade the boy David. In verse 33, he says, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And Goliath's been fighting since before you were born. He has more experience in the battlefield than you have in life, little boy. And so I don't think you quite understand what you would be up against. There's no way you should do this. That actually reminds me of Paul's counsel to Timothy, who was also young, but in leadership in the early church. And Paul says to him, let no man despise thy youth. Oh, you young listeners out there. Don't let anyone tell you you can't do something just because you're too young. Unless it's like drive a car or things like that, okay. Uh, but in terms of making a difference in the kingdom of God, let no man despise thy youth. God called Samuel as a boy, David as a boy, Mary as a young girl, Esther young. The stripling warriors, Joseph Smith, you name it. When God wants to change the world, he usually calls someone young to do it young enough that they don't yet know any better, that they shouldn't have so much confidence. <laughs> it's the older ones that get jaded and think, ah, there's no chance. It's the young ones that feel invincible. And with God's help, in a way you are. David knows it, and so he responds in 34 and 35. Thy servant kept his father's sheep, good shepherd, all along. There came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. Now, a lamb. Notice these details here. It's just one. Of a, of a flock that was barely worth protecting in its entirety. Just a few sheep. But no, a lamb. If it were me, I'd say, well, I only lost one, Dad. We got the rest. But not David. I went out after him. How's that for being proactive? Not considering it too late by any stretch. He went out and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. Now, how that, how's that for a detail? Again, if I thought it was too late because it had been dragged out of the, out of the flock... It's in the lion's mouth. It's definitely too late. It's definitely a lost cause. Well, David didn't agree. So when he arose up against me, so now I'm willing to put my life on the line for a mere lamb out of a flock of just a few sheep. This animal, this, this predator is now coming after me. Well, no worries. David says, I caught him by his beard. There's hand-to-hand -hand combat with a ferocious animal. And I smote him and slew him. Now, those are some impressive credentials. And I would simply say, based on David's experience, that before we face Goliath, I hope we have some prior experience beating lions and bears. God will give us opportunities to test our spiritual strength, to try our faith, to develop some righteous reflexes. I just hope we take advantage of those opportunities and pass those preliminary tests. David did. But notice what he says next, 36. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine, there's the religious dig again, shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And that makes all the difference. Notice he's not just saying, I have amazing experience. I've got credentials. I can do this. I've done it before. No, it's God has the credentials. 
God got me through that. I was scared to death, if he was pro probably being honest. But God strengthened me. I don't know, it was just this adrenaline rush, and I ju jumped in, and then I did the impossible, because God preserved me. I trust he will do the same. Because I am simply trying to take care of the lost sheep of Israel. I am facing the lions and bears among the Philistines, and they are God's enemies because they have mocked the living God, and he was alive and well with me then. He will be alive and well with me now. So let me do it. In 37, Saul agrees. He relents. He says to David, go. I can't believe I'm doing this. And the Lord be with thee. I'm afraid the Lord's no longer with me, but if he's with you, then go. Saul armed David with his armor, put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also, he armed him with a coat of mail. Uh-oh, you're sounding more and more like Goliath here, David. Uh, David's going to see that in a moment. David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go. He's ready to go march across the battlefield, and then he realizes, ah, no, 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 not a good, not a good idea. For he had not proved all this equipment he was wearing. David says to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. There's a couple lessons there. One, again, this, this similarity to Goliath. Why would I fight the enemy with the enemy's weapons? I'm just lowering myself to their level. And if all they have is the arm of flesh, <laughs> you think I'm going to take off the arm of God and settle for the arm of flesh? Just so it's a fair fight? Uh-uh. Oh, with God on my side, it, it would never be a fair fight, nor should it be. And I trust in Him. I see that sometimes when people attack the faith from a position of complete absence of faith. In terms of God speaking to the mind and the heart, and then shifting to a completely empirical, secular epistemology. In other words, how do we know what we know? We only know it through the mind. We can only know it through scientific measurements. It has to be completely rational. And anytime you hint at the non-rational, I'm going to mock it to make it the irrational and laugh it off the stage. Anybody that trusts in spiritual experience is, is a fool and feeling that pressure and feeling ashamed of what we cannot convey in purely rational terms. I can't weigh it. I can't measure it. I can't prove it. Then we lower ourselves to that merely rational epistemology. And that's an abdication of the most important weapon God has ever given us, the sword of the Spirit. And to leave that sword because the enemy doesn't believe in one? Not wise. Humbly, we can wield it and wield it well. We can hold to testimony of truth. At the very end of a great book by a German theologian from the early 20th century, Rudolf Otto, it's a book called The Idea of the Holy, and he's simply trying to defend the non-rational aspect of religion, namely the religious experience, the spirit, the transcendent, the power of God. And as he ends this beautiful book, he simply says, of course, someone who cannot allow for spiritual experience, none of this will make sense from the beginning. It's speaking a foreign language. I mean, it's, again, that's not a weapon in their arsenal. And so they'll look at you and think, You're, why would you even pick that thing up? It does no good. But he also points out, on the other hand, Again, there's, we're not seeing eye to eye here. What I'm testifying of, my spiritual experience, will do nothing to convince you. And Otto admits, yeah, that's true. All the bearing of testimony in the world will not convince someone who's not open to spiritual experience for themselves. But what Otto adds at the end is the reverse is also true. I can't convince them, but they can't disarm me. Because they're unwilling to come close enough in real, <laughs> he, the way he puts it is they're always outside the battlefield. Their weapons are too short to reach their target. 
because they can't say anything against the power and wisdom of God. I love that statement at the end of that book. I need to memorize it so I can do better justice to it. I apologize. But to me, there's something very powerful about that sense of security that comes when you realize God has given you arms and armor beyond anything the world can produce. David is getting a sense of that. I don't want to look and dress and act and fight like the Philistine. Because in that battle, he'll eat me alive. What am I left with? I'm left with the arms of God. And that's, those are arms I trust in. The other side of this is, I am not going to make the mistake the Philistine is making. Remember, who's this guy? The Philistine has an armor, a shield bearer to go before him. And I will not trust my safety to someone else's shield. I'm not, I'm not going to do it. In the parable of the sower, it talks about one of the seeds that can't grow. Well, it grows and then faints, you know, just withers and shrivels and dies in the, in the sun. is because it had no root in themselves. Important detail. For, for David here, no, I need root in myself. I need my own armor of God. And I'm grateful for everyone who helps me forge the implements and all the smiths out there that are hammering iron and letting sparks fly. But I have to make it fit to myself. Exact specifications. And so I've got some work to do. I need to become a smith of my own to create my own armor of God. And David is not going to trust someone else to do that dirty work. Instead, what does he do? Verse 40. He took his staff in his hand. That's another thing we never see. We always see him with a sling. We don't see him with a staff. What kind of staff would that be? Ah, the staff of a good shepherd. This is a shepherd, shepherd's crook, the one he uses to help lost sheep come back, the one he uses to fight off attacking lions and bears. He, he never wants to be without the tools of, of, of the good shepherd. And then what? He chose him five smooth stones out of the brook. Ah, stones, rocks of Israel. Smooth. Ah, rocks that were shaped by the running of living water. How many of those do I have? Have I shaped them with time? Have I had enough of the, of the living water run over me to smooth out some of my rough edges? He put them in a shepherd's bag. There's that element again. Every time you look, David is the good shepherd. The, into the shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a script, and his sling was in his hand. Now, this is artillery over infantry. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell has talked about this. This is going to be safer distance than the lion or the bear. And with all of that, David now draws near to the Philistine. We didn't see the sling before. Uh, back then, he grabbed the lion or the bear by the beard. Remember, that is hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, but he's progressed. And he realizes that the weapons that helped me through one fight might be insufficient for the next one. So I keep getting stronger. I keep developing deeper habits of spiritual strength. And I'm ready for whatever comes next because I'm not reliant on what came before. If things are getting harder and harder, or we're up against bigger and bigger enemies, then we need to up our game. And David has done just that. In verse 41, the Philistine came on, drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. There's our third figure. When the Philistine looked about, he's like, wait, where's the guy? I, don't, I can't even look down that far. He saw David, and he disdained him. In other words, he despised him. He looked down on him, literally as well as figuratively. For he was but a youth and ruddy, and a fair countenance. His face is still flushed. He probably does not even old enough to shave. The Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? There he is, still holding his shepherd's staff. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Oh, let no man despise thy youth. Goliath's doing exactly that. And not just despising this youth of Israel, but despising the God of Israel too. He's cursing David by Dagon. So this isn't just Goliath versus David. This is Dagon versus Jehovah. Who's going to win that battle? Well, we've seen it before. Unfazed, David tar starts talking smack back to the Philistines. Maybe that's why he had to be young, because young people are, are better at talking smack than old people usually are. 
He says in verse 45, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, although you're not even holding it. In other words, it looks to me like you're trusting the arm of flesh, and boy, do you have mountains of it. Meanwhile, how about me? I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. So this is not going to be man against man, because I'm going to lose that one, and everybody knows that. This is man against God, and God's on my side. Verse 46, This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee, and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, and to the wild beasts of the earth. And here's why. That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. That's the same kind of language we saw in Exodus. Uh, Jehovah beating the Egyptian pantheon, that they may know a God they refused to acknowledge. In the next verse, 47, he expands it beyond that. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. It's not enough that the world will know. Israel has to know too. And do we? Do we trust that the battle is the Lord's and are we willing to go in the power of his might in any direction he sends us? Well, what direction did David go in? Verse 48 and 49, it came to pass when the Philistine arose. He's ticked. This little boy's talking smack. He came and drew nigh to meet David. So picture Goliath lumbering across the valley, rushing towards David. Well, what would I do? I'd run too, and I'd run away, but not David. David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Remember Joseph's statement about the cause. Go forward, brethren, and not backwards, and on, on to the victory. That's what David's doing. David put his hand in his bag. He took thence a stone and slung it and smote the Philistine in his forehead. One spot that wasn't covered, a chink in the armor. And the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. By the way, so high that, and so fast the stone was flying that there was no chance for this armor, this shield bearer, to get between. There's again the danger of letting somebody else hold it for you. You've got to hold it yourself. But notice also, speaking of directions, Goliath running forward, David running forward, and then getting hit so hard in the forehead that it knocks you down. But he fell on his face? You'd think if you got hit by a stone so hard in the forehead, it would knock you back and you'd fall on your back. But no, fall on his face. That lets you know just how fast he's rumbling forward. <laughs> and David's running forward just as fast himself. There is courage among this, or in the, within this boy. In verse 50, so David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. You see how David won? Oh, no sword in the hand of David. David might have disagreed. I said, oh, I had a sword. Not, not the visible kind, though. Sword of the Spirit and the Word of God. Oh, I wield it well. Uh, and then the sling and the stone. Again, I think I mentioned it. Malcolm Gladwell talks about a difference in military technology. And Goliath was old school. He trusted in swords and spears and shields. And David was ready to go from infantry to artillery. And forget the hand-to-hand -hand combat. That worked with a lion and a bear. There's no way I'm getting out of the grasp of this Goliath. But if I keep my distance and stay far enough away that this heavy spear can't be thrown in my direction, and then let the stone fly, then the, this artillery will beat infantry any day. In some ways it's a matter, again, spirit over flesh, that Goliath's uh, weapons in some ways were earthbound, far more than what David had in his shepherd's bag. And to trust in the spirit, to trust in what was... In, in, in something further developed. I'm not going to fight today's battles with yesterday's weapons. I have to be better prepared than that. But since he had no sword of his own, literal one anyway, he unsheathed the sword of Goliath, and with it he cut off the giant's own head. 
We see that elsewhere in scripture, that the enemy that has dug a pit for their neighbor has fallen into the pit themselves. The sword you intended to use on me actually caused your own destruction, your own ultimate death. Verse 51 and 52 then, And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines. And as the chapter comes to its close a few verses later, it's a rout. I don't know what happened to the winner-takes-all approach that they had talked about to begin with, but once Goliath fell, the Israelite army arose. He went down. They came up and came rushing across the valley to take on the Philistine army, completely confident that God would be with them too. What did it take to get them from inaction to action? What did it take to move them from fear to faith? It took the faith of one little boy. And I think sometimes if we're willing to be the one and stand alone just long enough to prove that we're willing to do so, before we know it, we won't be alone anymore. Actually, we were never alone to begin with, and David knew it. God was with him. But in terms of more personal companions, Lead the charge, and the army will come running. That, among so many other things, is one of the lessons of David and Goliath. Oh, the masterpiece that my student painted. I am grateful for all that he saw. I'm grateful for all that the Spirit depicts for us, and I'm sure that you are painting masterpieces in your own mind. That's the case of real scripture study.